Sergeants, can we start the recordings, please? PC's going. Cloud is started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Bradley, can you give us the opening, please? Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your video. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We may begin, Chair. Thank you very much, Sergeant. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this hearing of the City Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, the committee will hold an oversight hearing on the city's plan for the impending lifting of the state and federal eviction moratoriums that were put into place to protect tenants from losing their housing during the pandemic and the potential influx of new clients in need of social services assistance. The committee will also hear intro 2050, sponsored by my colleague, Council Mark Levine. The COVID crisis has underscored the importance of safe and secure housing with the Center of Disease Control issuing guidance for a nationwide eviction moratorium. It has never been more important that housing is health care and a human right. It is both a public health and economic priority to keep people in their homes for the duration of the pandemic, but the, but the moratoriums will eventually end and we must have a plan in place to accommodate what could be a massive influx of new clients in need of assistance. Prior to the pandemic, nearly half of New York City households were rent burdened, meaning that they were paying more than 30% of their income toward rent. The unemployment rates have dramatically increased in the five boroughs, as they have around the country due to the economic fallout of the pandemic. The pandemic has further strained what was already a precarious situation for low-income people in New York, many of whom will likely have no way to remain in their homes once the moratorium has been lifted if the city, state, and federal governments don't take any further action to assist them. Intro 2050, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Levine, would expand the right to counsel for tenants facing evictions for eviction proceedings citywide immediate, um, immediately instead of the current phase-in. As the, as the right to counsel program has been implemented, evictions citywide have decreased with a 30% decline between February of 2019 and February of 2020, just before the pandemic began. I wanna thank all of the advocates and members of the public and those with lived experience who are joining us remotely today. Thank you to the representatives from the administration for joining us and I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. Uh, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Uh, we've been joined by council members Gibson, Grudenchik, Diaz, Rosenthal, Ayala, Levine, and Reynoso. Um, uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, that uh, Intro 2050 is a is co-prime co sponsored by Council Member Vanessa Gibson, and also we've been joined by Council Member Brad Lambert. Um, uh, I will, uh, before turning it over to Councilmember Levine and Councilmember Gibson, who would like to give opening statements, I'd like to thank my staff uh, who've worked on today's hearing, uh, my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, uh, my legislative director, Elizabeth Adams, and uh, my entire district staff who have been working uh, on uh, helping people uh, navigate uh, the system to make sure that they are getting the services that they need at this time. I'd also like to acknowledge my committee staff, uh, the committee staff to the General Welfare Committee, uh, Amanda Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, Natalie O'Marie, Policy Analyst, Frank Sarno, Finance Analyst, Rose Martinez, Senior Data, data Scientist, and Nicholas Montabano, Data Scientist. And with that, I'll turn it over um, to uh, Councilmember Mark Levine for an opening statement.
I apologize. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Levin. And um, thank you for acknowledging the incredible leadership of my colleague, Vanessa Gibson, who's been my partner in the Right to Counsel effort for years now. And we certainly wouldn't be here without her leadership. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, Chair Levin, uh, Right to Counsel, which has been in place in New York City since 2017, has actually been a game change. It has made New York City the first place in America to establish the basic right that people facing evictions in housing court should have the fairness that can only come when they have an attorney. And uh, this law has now been replicated around the country, seven cities as of last count. Uh, most importantly here in New York City, we've seen a reduction in the eviction rate of 40% prior to the pandemic. Uh, this has truly been a game change for tenants and for housing court in New York City. But as you remarked, Chair, the original law had a five year implementation period, partly because of the huge number of eviction cases and the need to build out a system. And as currently written, the law intro 136 wouldn't hit full phase in until the middle of 2022, until July of 2022. Well, we're facing an avalanche of evictions now, post moratorium that changes everything changes everything. We must ensure that every single person facing an eviction as we come out of this pandemic has the basic security of an attorney. And unless we amend intro 136, we're not going to be able to guarantee that for everyone who qualifies in every zip code. So this bill, intro 2050, seeks to immediately go city, citywide to every zip code so that every tenant who qualifies <clears throat> has the benefit of an attorney. We are not seeking to change the budget for this critical program. It's already been baseline. We want to use the resources that are in place for improving access to counsel for tenants and spread them out to every zip code in the city. So again, this is not a request for additional resources. This is a request to take the law citywide. And if you say, well, might that slow down the pace at which we can handle cases? Well, yes. And that actually has a lot of benefits. Uh, first and foremost, uh, public health. We don't wanna have courthouses that are once again jam full to unsafe levels, which we certainly saw in housing court prior to the pandemic. And uh, I certainly believe, and I think most of us would agree that um, having a natural break on the pace of cases in order to accommodate the supply of attorneys for tenants would actually be a good thing uh, from a public health perspective, a safety perspective, and a fairness perspective. Uh, this is what intro 2050 would bring about. And I'm really thrilled that today we are hearing it. I want to acknowledge the incredible coalition of activist groups uh, under the umbrella of the Right to Counsel Coalition that has um, led this fight for years now and is behind intro 2050. Thank you to everyone in the Right to Counsel Coalition. Um, and uh, shout out to my own chief of staff, Aya Keith, who's been a phenomenal leader in this effort from the very beginning. Uh, I'll acknowledge the committee staff when I speak later, but we appreciate their work as well. And now back to you, Chair Levin. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. Uh, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Gibson right now for remarks. Thank you so much, Chair Levin, and good afternoon, my colleagues, members of the General Welfare Committee, to my partner in this work on this journey, my friend, Councilmember Mark Levine, and Aya, to the entire staff, to the Right to Council Coalition, housing advocates, organizers, tenants, all across the city of New York. I'm very excited that today's hearing is happening. And I wanna thank you, Chair Steve Levin, for your leadership and your support. Um, I'm Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. I represent District 16 in the Bronx, and I'm proud to speak today about Intro 2050, which is on today's agenda, which will amend Local Law 136 of 2017, the right to counsel law by requiring the immediate implementation of access to legal services for tenants facing eviction proceedings in housing court citywide. In 2017, all of you remember the journey when the right to counsel law was enacted and chaptered by Mayor de Blasio. It was a different landscape for tenants in New York City. 
Many of them went to housing court without legal representation. Many did not understand the process. They made deals in the hallways and stairwells with attorneys. They agreed to stipulations that they could not comply with and many, many of them were not represented by legal representation. Since that time, we've seen other cities follow suit as New York City was groundbreaking and landmark in passing this important piece of legislation. We've seen Cambridge, Massachusetts, Newark, San Francisco, Cleveland, Boulder, Colorado, and most recently, the city of Baltimore passed similar measures around universal right to counsel. Prior to the passage of right to counsel, the rate of tenants in New York City facing eviction cases with legal rep representation in court was a mere 1% back in 2013, years ago. It has reached 38% by the end of 2019. In many of the neighborhoods that we targeted for right to counsel, it reached almost 67% of legal representation for tenants. Between 2013 and 2019, the number of evictions dropped to historic lows to 41%. Thanks to the data that was provided by the Office of Civil Justice, OCJ, it's been proven that when a tenant arrives at housing court armed with a lawyer facing an eviction proceeding, they are given quality services. They will most likely leave with a positive in outcome. When we unite, we win. And when we have representation, we can win in housing court. Uh, for example, in 2018, 2018 citywide residential evictions executed by city marshals declined by 5% compared to 2017 and by 31% compared to 2013. This indicates everyone that right to counsel is working. And now on the cusp of a global pandemic, due to the economic devastation brought to our city and this country due to COVID-19, the shutdown last March, countless New Yorkers and tenants left without work, loss of income, falling behind in rent, fighting to get the basic necessities. Many of our hardworking New Yorkers and tenants have not been able to pay their rent during this pandemic. And fear, again, once the eviction moratorium from the state and the federal governments are lifted, they will be taken to court and forced to leave their homes. On March 16th, 2020, when housing court closed with respect to nearly all new and pending matters with the exception of some illegal evictions and lockouts, emergency prepare, repairs, we've seen housing court essentially close its doors. But we know that when the moratorium is lifted, those cases will resume. And so that is why, as Council Member Mark Levine said, the introduction 2050 is so crucially important today in this climate and in this environment. And I wanna thank everyone for being on this journey with us. This is one of the best pieces of legislation I've ever been a part of because I know it's making an impact. I see the faces of tenants who have been saved with a lawyer, who remain in their homes, have a roof over their head, who've given stability and are able to take care of their families and children. Those faces look like the city of New York. They look like me and my community that I represent in the Bronx. And so I wanna thank the Office of Civil Justice. I wanna thank Jordan Dressler and his team, as well as HRA and DA and all of our legal service providers, Housing Court Answers, Tenants United, everyone for their work thus far, spe specifically during this pandemic. I thank you for all of the work you've done. To the Right to Counsel Coalition and everyone that's been united and organized along the way, I thank you so much. This important legislation is needed now more than ever because of the rise in evictions, not only in traditional zip codes, but many other zip codes that have not faced high rates of eviction. And so to all New Yorkers, we want you to know that we are here for you. We are united like never before, and we will get this done working with the administration and the advocates and legal service providers and everyone who's had a role. In my own borough of the Bronx, I really wanna thank Casa Bronx and Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition and Bronx Defenders and CAMBA everyone in the Right to Counsel Coalition. Thank you for your work. And thank you to my partner, Council Member Levine and the staff and my Director of Policy and Legislation, Jeffrey Velasquez and my Chief of Staff, Justin Cortez. Thank you so much for your work in bringing Intro 2050 to the forefront and being on today's agenda. Thank you so much, Chair Levin. And I look forward to today's hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Councilmember Gibson.
Um, and right now I'll turn it over to Council Committee Amenta Kolawan to square in the uh, Thank you, Chair Levin. My name is Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the Committee on General Welfare for the New York City Council. I'm going to be moderating today's hearing and I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you're called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a delay of a few seconds before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. And all public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Now for today's hearing, the first panel is going to include representatives from the Department of Social Services, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. In order of speaking, we will have Jordan Dressler, Civil Justice Coordinator of HRA's Office of Civil Justice. And for the Q&A session, Erin Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner, Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs, Bruce Jordan, HRA Chief Homelessness Prevention Officer, Sarah Zuidervin, HRA Deputy Commissioner for Prevention and Housing Assistance, and Rebecca Klein, Senior Policy Advisor, Office of Civil Justice at HRA. I'm now going to administer the oath of, to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions, Jordan Dressler. Yes. Thank you. Erin Drinkwater. Yes. Thank you. Bruce Jordan. Yes. Thank you. Sarah Zui Dervin. Yes. Rebecca Klein. Yes. Thank you. I will now call on Jordan Dressler to testify. My, I'm, I'm off mute. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Levin, members of the General Welfare Committee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the Department of Social Services work on rental and eviction prevention support during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Jordan Dressler and I represent the Office of Civil Justice of the Human Resources Administration, where I am proud to oversee our work as the Civil Justice Coordinator. I'm joined today by Bruce Jordan, HRA's Chief Homelessness Prevention Officer, and Sarah Zuterveen, Deputy Commissioner for Prevention and Housing Assistance at HRA. The Homelessness Prevention Administration's mission is to execute programs and services aimed at keeping New Yorkers stably housed, ensuring that they are connected to resources they're eligible for, such as rental assistance and legal services. Within the Homelessness Prevention Administration are the Housing and Homelessness, Homeless Services Initiatives Division, the Rental Assistance Program, the Early Intervention Outreach Team, and the Office of Civil Justice, all of which are vital in assisting New Yorkers in need. As part of HRA DSS, the Office of Civil Justice launches, manages, and monitors the city's civil legal services programs for low-income and other vulnerable New Yorkers in need. OCJ is currently working with over 70 nonprofit legal service organizations to ensure thousands of New Yorkers in need across the five boroughs have access to legal services in legal matters involving housing, immigration, and the workplace. New York City has taken an aggressive and multi-pronged approach to help New Yorkers stay in their homes and secure stable and affordable housing. DSS has leveraged its programs to specifically address housing stability and eviction prevention. Through these initiatives, we've built a strong foundation, enabling us to effectively serve unstably housed New Yorkers across the five boroughs. Among these programs, we wanna highlight the following. First, legal services for tenants and the city's right to counsel law. New York City has become the national leader in ensuring the tenants facing housing, housing instability have access to quality legal assistance to help them preserve and protect their homes. First, through dramatic multi-year investments in expanding legal services for tenants, implemented in partnership with over 20 nonprofit legal services organizations across the city, and culminating in the city's enactment and HRA's implementation of the nation's first right to counsel initiative, ensuring the tenants facing eviction in housing court or in NYCHA administrative proceedings have access to free legal services. 
The impacts of these efforts have been dramatic and positive. Residential evictions by city marshals fell by over 40% between 2013 and 2019, while nationwide evictions trended upwards. And the percentage of tenants facing eviction in court with the help and protection of legal representation stood at 38% at the end of 2019, up from only 1% in 2013. Moreover, in the overwhelming majority of cases, when tenants have lawyers in eviction proceedings, they get positive results. In resolved cases in fiscal year 2020, 86% of households represented in housing court and public housing proceedings by OCJ funded tenant lawyers were able to remain in their homes. Every day, OCJ partners with legal services providers, court administrators, judges, and other system stakeholders to bolster access to legal assistance. This effort has led to hundreds of thousands of tenants facing eviction proceedings, being able to leverage the support of high quality and free legal assistance through our programs. To date, over 450,000 New Yorkers have received free legal representation, advice or assistance in eviction and other housing related matters since 2014 through HRA's legal services programs. Next, turning to rental assistance programs. First, through reestablishing rental assistance programs and then streamlining them into one program aligned with the state's FEHEPS rental assistance program, we have increased access to rental assistance for New Yorkers struggling to bridge the gap between income and rent. By consolidating prior programs, it is now easier for tenants to request and secure rental assistance. For landlords, fewer programs means easier access and an increased willingness to work with us. We have invested in building out a landlord management system, making it easier for landlords to receive rent payments and easier for DSS to manage caseloads. Additionally, we have worked to expand the accessibility of emergency rent arrears grants, also known as one-shot deals, a program designed to support housing stability by flexibly meeting the circumstances of a household, which may be in need of rent, utilities, and mortgage payment support to address arrears, thereby maintaining their housing. And next, home base. We have nearly doubled the number of home base centers across the five boroughs where New Yorkers experiencing housing instability can be connected to various homeless prevention services, as well as where families and individuals transitioning from shelter to permanent housing can receive aftercare support. The programs mentioned highlight our prevention first approach to addressing housing instability. And due to the work of our staff and service providers, we have connected more than 155,000 New Yorkers to rental assistance and rehousing programs, and also have nearly 60,000 rent burdened households annually pay back rent for utilities. Next, I wanna to turn to DSS's eviction prevention work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, we are proud of our work to increase housing stability and reduce evictions among New Yorkers in need. We are aware that we are now in a markedly different environment. COVID-19 has impacted us, our staff, our clients, and our nonprofit partners. COVID-19 has brought on new challenges that we continue to tackle every day, particularly around maintaining and promoting housing stability. Today, we'd like to share with you the actions that we've taken to ensure New York City tenants have the support needed to prevent evictions and further displacement during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our staff at DSS, along with our nonprofit service providers have been working around the clock to leverage many of the programs mentioned earlier, along with updated strategies to address these emergency circumstances. Since the start of the pandemic, the city has advocated for a moratorium on evictions in the legislature and the courts. We also successfully advocated to the state to allow us to move our cash assistance application and interview process online and over the telephone which meant that no one needed to travel and come into an HRA office to receive rent or utility arrears grants in person. In addition, we transformed our approach to making legal assistance available to tenants in need in response to this crisis. Working in collaboration with OCJ's legal services partners, housing court answers, and the mayor's office, we rapidly established a housing legal hotline to provide access to live phone-based legal advice and assistance provided by our tenant legal services partners. Through the hotline, tenants with questions and concerns about eviction and housing court, as well as other landlord tenant issues are receiving legal advice and assistance Monday through Friday. 
These services are currently available via 311 and the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit through the City's Tenant Helpline and through Housing Court Answers Hotline. Legal advice services are free and available to all New York City re residential renters with housing questions or issues, regardless of income, regardless of zip code, and regardless of immigration status. At the start of the pandemic, the New York City Housing Court closed with respect to nearly all new and pending matters, including eviction proceedings, except for quote unquote essential proceedings such as legal actions to restore possession for tenants who were illegally evicted or locked out and proceedings to compel landlords to make critical emergency repairs such as restoring lost heat or hot water. To address the legal needs of these tenants, OCJ worked with legal providers in the housing court and immediately established a case referral protocol to connect all unrepresented tenants who file emergency cases in court with free legal representation. Since the start of the pandemic, unrepresented tenants in any zip code who file an action to be restored to possession after being illegally locked out by their landlord or who file a housing part action for emergency repairs are referred to OCJ by the court for free legal representation by one of OCJ's provider partners. When the housing court expanded its operations beyond hearing emergency lockout and repair cases and began moving forward in some pending eviction cases, OCJ's legal providers were there to, assi to assist and protect tenants in need. Specifically, the court scheduled thousands of eviction proceedings that were pending resolution prior to the start of the pandemic for status and settlement conferences and required that only those cases in which all parties were represented by legal counsel could be scheduled for a court conference. OCJ's legal services providers have participated in thousands of court conferences representing tenant clients in pre-pandemic eviction cases. As a result, all tenant respondents in eviction proceedings handled by the housing court during this period have been represented by counsel, regardless of zip code or immigration status or income with an income waiver from OCJ. Throughout the pandemic, and prior to the most recent legislation preventing any housing, housing court eviction activity in the short term, when state law and court directives enabled landlords to file motions in the housing court to permit pre-pandemic eviction warrants to proceed or the scheduling of conferences and eviction cases involving allegations of nuisance behavior or health and safety issues. OCJ has worked with the court and legal providers to ensure that no tenant faced the threat of eviction without access to free legal representation. OCJ has been making free legal representation available to unrepresented tenants who responded in these cases through pre-court referrals and by assigning counsel to any tenant at such conference who wants legal representation in their case. This initiative has been citywide and universal. All tenants facing eviction warrants have been eligible regardless of zip code, immigration status, or whether the tenant may have previously declined or been found ineligible for legal representation under the Universal Access Program, and regardless of household income with an income waiver by OCJ. Additionally, to supplement the work above, OCJ has worked in partnership with the mayor's office to conduct proactive outreach to tenants at risk of eviction throughout the pandemic, including a mail campaign announcing the launch of the tenant helpline last spring, as well as targeted mail and phone outreach initiatives directed at New York City tenants who face pre-pandemic eviction warrants or who were at risk of eviction for failing to appear in court proceedings. Now turning to the federal and state landscape on rent relief. We'd like to provide an update on the current federal and state landscape around rent relief and eviction moratoriums. As you know, the federal government has enacted several stimulus efforts to address the emerging crises brought on by the pandemic. Most recently in late December, the federal government approved measures to increase SNAP benefits for millions of Americans facing hunger, providing funding for emergency food banks and children's meals. And today's focus, funding rent relief and most recently issued an eviction moratorium extension through the end of March. At the state level, New York has most recently passed an eviction ban extending protections for most tenants through May 1st of this year. Under the newly enacted state law, the COVID-19 Emergency Eviction and Foreclosure Prevention Act, tenants can avert eviction by their landlord if they have lost income or incurred ex increased expenses during the pandemic, or if moving from their home poses a hardship during the pandemic. To be protected by this law, tenants must sign a hardship declaration form, which can be found by the New York State, be found on the New York State Court's website, and deliver it to their landlord or the landlord's agent or to the housing court if they have a pending case. 
By signing and delivering this form, such tenants cannot be evicted from their primary residence pursuant to a pending case, and their landlord may not file new cases to evict such tenants until at least May 1st, 2021. For more information on how these eviction protections may apply to specific tenants, we encourage New Yorkers to contact the city's tenant helpline by calling 311 and saying tenant helpline. Additionally, through the New York State Homes and Community Renewal uh, Department, the state is administering the extended COVID rent relief extension program where eligible households can receive a one-time rental payment with federal stimulus funding from the earlier CARES Act. We are pleased to see action taken by the state to address the real concern of tenants paying their rent through this pandemic. While limited in funding and with upcoming expirations, the rent relief program and eviction moratorium respectively are more tools in the toolbox for tenants to take advantage of during this unprecedented time. In the state budget that was released last week, the state has made provision for the implementation of the recently enacted federal rent relief program in the federal stimulus legislation. The program will be administered by the State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, and we look forward to working with OTADA on the design and implementation of this program, including the implementation of rent relief allocated directly to the city. Now I'd like to turn to the legislation being heard as part of today's hearing, intro number 2050, by lead sponsors, council members Levine and Gibson. If enacted, this bill would amend local law 136 of 2017, the housing court right to council law, to require the immediate citywide implementation of access to legal services for tenants facing eviction proceedings in housing court and NYCHA administrative proceedings. The administration is currently reviewing the impact of this legislation. While we are in favor of the spirit of the legislation, and during the pandemic, we have made right to council representation available on a citywide basis without regard to zip code to meet the urgent needs of tenants facing housing instability, we believe that as drafted, the bill could hinder this flexibility, which has allowed OCJ and its provider partners to be immediately responsive to the needs of tenants in court and in the community. Moreover, there's uncertainty about the timing and approach taken by the federal and state governments on eviction moratoria and the housing legal landscape, and about the needs for legal help in and out of court to assist tenants affected by these protections. We look forward to further discussions with the council and stakeholders on this bill. And in the meantime, we are confident that the current law, our structure and approach, and our ongoing dialogue with legal services providers, court administrators, and other system stakeholders will enable us to effectively and efficiently make legal assistance and protection available to tenants in need across the five boroughs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and speak on the work that DSS and our partners have advanced to protect tenants in need. We look forward to ensuring New Yorkers at risk of eviction have the resources to fend off displacement and to our ongoing partnership with the City Council to overcome the crisis brought on by this pandemic. Thank you, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Before I call on Chair Levin for questions, I'd like to remind council members to please use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Please remember to keep questions and answers to five minutes. I will now turn it over to Chair Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kilowan. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Dressler, and, and I wanna thank all of the representatives of the administration for uh, being here today to answer questions. Um, so I'll keep my questions somewhat brief here um, before turning it over to my colleague. Um, and um, uh, after my questions, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Levine and give some questions. Um, my first question is, um, what is the plan for the administration um, communicating to the public um, what their options are as, you know, because there's various um, iterations that we've seen so far, um, different state laws, different state initiatives, um, uh, obviously um, uh, federal eviction moratorium. Uh, how, what is the plan to communicate to the public? Um, are we, um, doing television advertisement? Um, what's the radio advertisement? Um, I haven't seen anything on, on TV about this, um, you know, but I do see the advertisements around uh, COVID initiatives. Um, uh, 
Uh, so what's the plan there in terms of public outreach? So I think, uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, there have been efforts uh, both within DSS and more broadly with the mayor's office to protect tenants in the public engagement unit around uh, outreach uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, when uh, there was a, a need to uh, distribute and get out uh, good, reliable, and often very changing uh, information about what the various protections were uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we all uh, got together to put together the uh, tenant helpline, um, which provides access both to uh, static information as well as more individualized uh, legal advice uh, for tenants across the city. Um, uh, that was launched in April uh, with a uh, postcard campaign uh, targeting neighborhoods across the city to make folks avail aware of the availability of the tenant helpline through 311. Uh, that reached uh, approximately 1.3 million uh, recipients uh, in terms of postcards. And um, we've received thousands of calls uh, since that time, uh, questions ranging from uh, I need legal advice and assistance to is the housing court open, uh, what are the protections, uh, and, and so forth. Um, uh, we've conducted more targeted outreach to tenants uh, to try to address some of the more uh, specific and changing details around the housing legal landscape, be it tenants who might have been facing a pre-pandemic eviction warrant at a time when the court was moving forward uh, with uh, certain cases in which a landlord was seeking to enforce that warrant involving unrepresented tenants. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that many, many tenants in the, in the city of New York already had counsel. And we have been instrumental, I think, in providing uh, our legal services providers uh, with good and up to the minute information about the status of the housing legal landscape at any point in time, distributing the various uh, uh, orders, uh, executive orders, administrative orders um, that have uh, sometimes changed the ground under uh, practitioners and tenants alike. Looking forward in the future, I know that with respect to the hardship declaration, Mayor's Office to Protect Tenants uh, is uh, leading a campaign to conduct uh, a pretty broad-based outreach to make people aware of the availability of the hardship declaration, eligibility for the hardship declaration uh, that can uh, uh, put a pause if you're eligible on a housing court eviction proceeding uh, or the threat of a housing court eviction proceeding uh, through May 1st uh, under the new state law. And for our part, we are looking at a much broader uh, public uh, media campaign around the right to counsel uh, in the spring um, for when housing court is uh, open. Part of the issue around that is that the opening of housing court is and has been a moving target. And we certainly don't want to uh, lead anyone to think that housing court is open when it's not. Um, throughout this process, whenever there have been communications from the court to litigants in housing court, either inviting them uh, or uh, requiring them to make a virtual appearance back in court, making them aware of an obligation to answer a petition, as was the case towards the end of the uh, calendar year, uh, we have been successful in ensuring that there is information about the availab availability of legal assistance included in those materials and directing uh, affected tenants to reach out to take advantage of that legal assistance. Um, is the city helping tenants fill out uh, hardship applications? I think at this point, uh, anyone who has a question about whether or how to fill out a hardship declaration can and should call 311 and access the tenant helpline. Um, and if it is something uh, more complex, it requires the assistance of counsel. Uh, they'll be connected with one of our legal services providers to uh, walk through that more fact-specific situation. Um, uh, uh, the Housing Court Answers, which is uh, our nonprofit partner, both uh, with our office, as well as the Office of Court Administration, um, is also a uh, terrific resource to help navigate the hardship declaration process. Um, the city applied for uh for its own allocation from the federal government for uh, rent relief funds. Um, and the city's allocation is about 20% of the state's allocation. Um, and obviously the city's need is, is much greater than 20% of the, uh, the, state's, the overall state need. Um, what's the city's 
I mean, first off, what's the city's plan to get its fair share um, with regard to the rest of New York State? And then um, are we looking at setting up our own rent relief program outside of uh, the program that uh, would be administered through OTDA or, or DHCR? Thank you for the question, Chair Lim. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Erin Drinkwater, um, to uh, respond to that. That's okay. Thanks for the council or the question, council member. Um, yes, yeah, so New York City was allocated uh, direct contribution um, in addition to what the state was allocated. And we were in ongoing conversations with OTDA about the administration of those state dollars and what those programs will look like. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it's yet to be undecided. It's yet it's it's as yet undecided um, whether whether the city will be administering it through um, your agency, for example, rather than being administered through the state agency. Does the city hope to be able to administer it themselves? Apologies, I had done exactly what I meant to ask me not to do, which was mute myself again. Um, so again, so our conversations are with OTDA. Our goal is to make sure that these funds are being targeted and getting out the door most effectively and most efficiently to those who are in need of assistance and rent arrears. Um, would be happy to provide the council, this committee and others with updates as those conversations progress. But at this time, uh, we don't have more detail. Um. The statute allows landlords to apply with tenants. Um, uh, what is the city's plan to facilitate this? As that would be a, a you know a preferable outcome. Sorry, can you repeat the question for landlords to apply with with tenants? With their tenants, yeah, uh, as part you know with, concurrent with their tenants. So I'm going to ask Bruce if he has additional detail on this to to jump in. Yes, so thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Councilmember Levin. Um, as part of those discussions that uh, Aaron uh, mentioned with the state, that particular off-ramp is being discussed. I also believe HPD would play some type of role in that along with their CBOs to help the landlords access that process. But like Aaron said, we don't have the details at the moment. Okay, so there's a role for HPD in making contact with landlords, is that right? So landlords that are, that are all registered with HPD? Yeah, it would probably help feed that into the OTDA portal or whatever process would be there. And they would help do some type of outreach, I understand. But there's preliminary discussions right now. Nothing's been worked out. Um, and then can you speak about the city's plans to reach some of the, the hardest to reach um, uh, clients, potential clients that would be um, people without immigration status, um, people with disabilities, the elderly, um, tenants without access to technology. I mean, I, I think of, you know, a senior citizen who, um, you know, is really not, um, you know, just doesn't have that, that type of uh, access or um, facility with technology. Yeah, I mean, I can address that. I mean, if the, the question is a, certainly the question about immigration status, legal services are available to uh, the, all New York City tenants, regardless of immigration status. Um, that's been uh, made that clear in every communication um, that uh, is out there. Um, the, the question of the, uh, the access to technology um, is a trickier one. Um, one thing I would point out that with respect to legal proceedings, um, one thing that has been of moderate success has been just, you know, the telephone. Um, and so the courts have been holding telephonic conferences in many instances, um, and uh, ten tenant lawyers, of course, are able to stay in close touch with their clients um, uh, through the phone. Um, and that has, uh, at least in part, made sure that uh, tenants are informed about the status of their case, are able to uh, assist with their own uh, defense in a housing court eviction proceeding and are able to uh, coordinate well with their uh, counsel. Um, 
I know that, um, and I'll turn it over to, to Aaron, uh, to talk a little bit about some of the uh, actions being taken uh, with respect to HRA and access to benefits um, with respect to technology. Sure, so we recognize um, the you know, complicating factors of COVID in terms of highlighting some of the things like the digital divide, um, the you know, inability for folks who don't have access to broadband or the internet, um, but have also um, you know, made a real effort to ensure that HRA programs and services are available to clients in the comfort of their home through Access HRA, um, that they're able to call 311 and InfoLine um, we're really working to address some of the issues with wait times on InfoLine um, that I know some advocate groups have, have relayed to us. Um, additionally, um, we continue to get out information, as Jordan said, through um, some more uh, non-technology you know, technology related ways. Um, the agency, since the start of the pandemic, has been holding weekly calls with the commissioner uh, which our elected uh, partners and CBO partners join um, each week anywhere from you know, 150 to 200 callers call in, have the ability to ask the commissioner questions directly about programs and policies that have changed over the course of these past couple of months. And then each week that email is, or excuse me, that call is followed by an email. Uh, the distribution to that uh, has grown to about uh, 4,500 individuals. So each week that uh, email is getting sent to a wide cut of CBO partners across the city, as well as elected staff um, across the city who we hope are relaying that information as well in the communities that they serve and represent. Um, what is the city's plan on um, the, the federal law requires a prioritization of, of individuals, um, tenants under 50% of AMI. What is the city's plan um, to execute that requirement? How is the city going about um, tiering its priorities um, in terms of communities that have been hardest hit through um, COVID? Or how is that? How is that? Um, because because it's it's clear at the moment, at least, without any further allocation from the federal government, that we don't have enough money to cover um, uh, ev all rent arrears in the city right now. I think that it's been estimated, I think by the, one of the landlord um, associations that uh, $1.2 billion um, is the overall rental arrears in the city right now. And obviously that's, that's far exceeds what, um, what we have here in New York City. So how are we, um, how are we addressing prioritization? Can you hear me, Councilman? Sorry? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, as, as myself and Aaron uh, previously stated so far in this testimony in relation to the stimulus, um, the conversation are just, you know, just started with the state and everyone can apply and you don't need to be in housing court and you don't have to have uh, a certain immigration status, right, for the stimulus money. But I think one of the things the city is thinking about and trying to define populations and identify them to the state and whatever mechanism they're gonna use in partnership with us is to prioritize people in housing court that could be brought back, let's say cases that started, that were brought back to the court from June of 2020 to December, 2020, that might be at most, most risk to be teed up once the moratorium ends. So that's just one ideal. It hasn't been written in stone, but there's some of the discussions we're starting to have. Okay, so people with the furthest back cases. Um, so this will be my last question for this round, then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. But um, big picture, are we anticipating when, um, when more, the, whatever moratoria we're talking about, whether it's the state moratorium or the federal moratorium, um, uh, are we anticipating that we are going to see a, um, a deluge of, of eviction, uh, evictions filed. Um, and do we think right now with the, with, the, with the resources that we have from the federal government with stimulus dollars, do we think that we have the uh, 
capacity to deal with that? Do we think that we have the the just the resources to deal with that, the money to be able to offset um, those types of, of arrears? Uh, uh, can I just address the lead, the, the housing court and legal services aspect of that question first? Um, you know, the, there's going to be a sort of natural limit on uh, the timing, the jeopardy uh, that a tenant may face in housing court due to the limited capacity in the housing court. Um, there, it, it is extremely unlikely bordering on the impossible that the New York City Housing Court can return to what it looked like in 2018, in 2017. Uh, the number of cases that were filed in housing court was already on a downswing um, heading into uh, city fiscal year 20. Um, and needless to say that downswing has continued uh, throughout the pandemic with far fewer cases filed. When right, the court- it's, it's, it's being artificially suppressed. So when, when the, when the spigot gets turned back on, I mean, is there a, I mean, I guess the question is, is it, do we anticipate that it's going to be, a, you know, the spigot, I mean, just use that metaphor for a second, it's gonna be turned on at full blast. We're we expecting that it's gonna be turned on gradually. Um, whether or not, I mean, housing court has, the, I, I understand what you're, what you're getting at, which is that housing court just has, has a natural limit in terms of the number of cases that it could administer, but, but, um, but uh, you know, are we? I'm talking about the, the cases being filed. Are we going to be able to deal with the, this onslaught of cases, or do we ex not expect that there will be an onslaught of cases? Or I mean, how how are we reconciling that eventually we, we need the money to be able to offset a lot of these arrears that people are not going to be able to afford? I mean, frankly, like you know, who's who's you know who's banking escrow you know uh, 15 months of rent. They can't if they're not having if they're not having access to a to a one shot. You know, on, on the filing question, uh, you know, all, all we can do, I think, is look to the most recent uh, data. Um, filing of eviction proceedings uh, has been down compared to the year before, which was already down compared to the year before that. That's what we didn't have fourteen percent unemployment in the city. I mean, that's when well, people were able to make. Them. Job. True. Uh, the uh, the case volume is quite a bit lower than it was, um, and part of that uh, is uh, in response to uh, the challenges that all litigants face in housing court, and the knowledge that uh, an eviction proceeding filed uh, is going to be met with uh, a lawyer for the tenant on the other side of that case. And all the challenges and the expenses on the landlord's side uh, that come along with having to uh, actually mount an actual case, which is a, uh, as uh, Councilmember Levine said, uh, part of the game change associated with the right to counsel. Okay, but um, I mean, I guess, how, let me ask it this way. How many renters, how many uh, tenants do we believe in New York City right now um, has arrears that are due to, to the pandemic? Do we have a kind of estimate of, of how many tenants we're talking about? I don't have, I don't have, I don't have an estimate on that number. Then of those, of that universe, how many uh, are able to file for a hardship application? How many hardship applications have been filed? It's, it's hard to say. It's only been several hundred, according to the ones that have been filed with the court. Remember that hardship declarations can be submitted to uh, uh, landlords directly. And it's way too soon to say how many of those have come through. Most importantly, that, that, that number is just a, a, small, a small share of what's expected. Uh, as the communication from the uh, housing court to uh, litigants in all cases uh, only occurred this past weekend. Um, so they are expecting thousands of hardship declarations to be filed to uh, act as a, a, a delay on uh, pending cases, at least through May 1st. Okay, I'm just, I'm not totally sure I see the big picture here of, you know, the 
what I anticipate to be hundreds of thousands of potential cases. I, you know, I, I think that we're, if we're looking at the kind of world of, I understand that the, there's kind of deterrence, the, the, the length of time it takes to take someone to court, um, the fact that they might have access or they're likely to have access to a lawyer, um, um, the, you know, the fact of just kind of like administratively housing court is going to have to take a long time to, to go through cases. And so it might not be in the landlord's best interest um, to go, you know, to pay for their own attorney to go through that process, to, you know, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a little, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing the, the kind of big picture strategy for how to deal with you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of, of, of instances. So if I may uh, interject, Councilman, I think uh, I would like to piggyback off of one term you mentioned in your question, which was some people might not have access to a one shot. So I think part of this formula of the unknown, the, the cliff that you're implying would be the fact that since the beginning of the pandemic, the HRA workforce along with OTADA and certain waivers and also working with the unions and, and setting up a uh, work from home telework system that we had no model or precedent for. Uh, staff both in, in places where we needed to stay client facing open facilities, which we have some in each borough and the extension of our online access like uh, Aaron had testified earlier. I really believe that our ability to keep business open pretty much as usual which we have done throughout the pandemic. We've continued to process one-shot deals, whether it has housing court, whether it was all housing court or no housing court at all. So hopefully some of those cases will continue to filter through, which will hopefully to make or help minimize this, the cliff that we're all hopefully and anticipating won't happen. But I just think that should be noted that we are still doing a brisk business in, in one-shot deals and you don't require housing court action. Thank you, Mr. Um, okay, I'll turn it over to Council Member Levine and, and Council Member Gibson for questions. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I do want to start by thanking you, Jordan, for what you've done over the last four years to, to put together this office and to, um, and to build it out. Uh, re really, really grateful for your leadership. Uh, I do also, as promised, want to thank the incredible team on this committee, the General Welfare Committee, who's worked so hard on this. Uh, Amenta Kilowan Council, Crystal Pond, and Natalie Omari, who are the policy analysts. And, um, and Jordan, I just wanted to start by asking if you can clarify, uh, how many times have landlords been allowed to proceed with an eviction since the pandemic began? According to the data that we've seen from the Department of Investigation, residential evictions by city marshals have occurred four times since the beginning of the pandemic, four. Right, but there are a, a, a vastly larger number of, of uh, pre-pandemic evictions where the motions are at least proceeding, correct? There were roughly, there have been roughly 3,700, 3,700 motions filed by landlords since those motions were permitted uh, in the fall uh, to be restored to the calendar. Um, uh, but many of those cases remain pending um, because in all of those cases, uh, legal representation was made available to tenants. Okay. Um, if, if, I, if I could, Council Member, just yeah. because I think this exemplifies the approach that we've really uh, worked to take since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this was a situation uh, where uh, due to the changes in the uh, governor's executive orders, coupled with the statewide court uh, administrative orders in which uh, the New York City Housing Court uh, was ready to permit uh, pre-pandemic uh, warrants of eviction that had been previously ordered by courts to proceed. And so uh, we advocated with the housing court to institute a motion practice as in partnership with uh, probably all of the advocates who are on this, uh, on this call today, as well as all the legal services providers 
to institute a motion practice to require the landlord to come back to the court and ask permission to proceed. Not only because this was the right thing to do in terms of uh, the legal process, but because it would provide us with an opportunity to work in partnership with the providers in the court to put to put in place legal services providers on a rotation so that we could ensure that every tenant had access to legal representation in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, this was uh, a new approach for the court, a new approach for providers and a new approach for us. Um, and we did so without, uh, without uh, consideration of zip code, without consideration of income with an income waiver from OCJ. Um, this really exemplifies the approach we've taken since the beginning of the pandemic and it's the approach that we intend to take heading through the rest of this fiscal year, as well as into the next fiscal year, which was intended to be our full year of implementation anyway, when we were going to be doing away with a zip code approach uh, in any of them. Um, so uh, we have accelerated that process in the midst of this pandemic, and we intend to continue that uh, citywide without regard to the zip code approach here. Absolutely, and we appreciate that. And the concern is that the avalanche of evictions ahead of us is going to make all this much more difficult and going to make the stakes so much higher. And that's the reason why we're pushing forward this amendment to the existing law in the, in the form of eventual 2050. And I, I know you sort of touched on this, but could you just tell us again, what is, what is the administration's position on uh, this piece of legislation? And if you're not supporting it, why not? You know, look, as I said, we, we, we certainly not only support the spirit of the law, but I think that we are uh, really implementing uh, this, the, the law uh, in, in great respects, even today, by ensuring that uh, zip code is no longer a factor in terms of determining eligibility for legal services. I think one of the things that we want to discuss and keep an eye on, uh, discuss with, with uh, the council um, and other stakeholders, is the level of flexibility that it allows and the level of flexibility it might remove. Um, if we have uh, tenants uh, in New York City who need help with hardship declarations who aren't in proceedings, they wouldn't necessarily get legal services through under the right to counsel laws. It's limited to those who are in proceedings. And one thing that we've done since the beginning of the pandemic is uh, try to I'm be flexible. Expired and remain uh, responsive to the needs in the community, whether it's in the form of providing advice through the Housing Legal Helpline uh, or uh, ensuring the tenants who are facing, who need critical repairs through uh, emergency HP actions have access to legal assistance. So uh, it is a cliche to say the devil's in the details, but we wanna be sure that we're all moving the same direction allowing for the right kind of flexibility while still committing to uh, citywide implementation in the coming. And, and um, I'm short on time. I'll, I'll just ask the chair's in, indulgence for just w one or two more questions, and I'll, I'll try and make it quick, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Of course. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, um, we need to ensure that no cases proceed um, without the tenant having an attorney. And uh, that's going to be tougher and higher stakes in the months ahead post-moratorium. Um, am I correct that uh, any judge or the OCA more broadly, Office of Court Administration more broadly, has the discretion to hold from proceeding on any case uh, if the tenant does not have the attorney? You know, the, the, I'll, I'll answer the question this way. Uh, the, the court, is, the presiding court in any particular case uh, can uh, make its determinations on scheduling and what needs to be in place and how long a case may, may take. Uh, in its discretion based on input from the parties. I think, you know, in, in response to your question, council member, I think nothing succeeds like success. And so what we have done is try to model uh, an approach that uh, makes legal services available to those who reach out for it prior to that first court appearance, whenever it's scheduled or rescheduled by the court, as well as at that first court appearance as the law requires. Uh, that's been a success when we worked uh, when we worked it out with respect to the so-called 213 motions, those motions to enforce pre-pandemic warrants. And because of that success, uh, I think, uh, when it came time for the court to start hearing a, a small but important number of pre-pandemic nuisance holdovers that are permitted to proceed even now in the midst of the uh, court stay, uh, this idea of setting up an upfront court uh, part 
with a legal provider who's working on rotation to make legal services available right then and there, uh, the court came to us with that proposal and said, we'd like to set up a similar part, a nuisance part. Uh, our discussions with our legal providers across the city as a result were very straightforward. And we had the pools and tools in place that we had developed over the last several months, a rotation, an understanding of how cases can go and an ex expectation of offering legal representation in these cases that we were able to mobilize virtually immediately. Those cases began uh, to be heard in the housing court in the four big boroughs uh, this week, or, I'm sorry, last week. Um, and we're in constant dialogue about how that's going. So I think as long as we can continue to show uh, efficiency and effectiveness in our implementation, uh, we think we'll have good partners on the court side as well as on the provider side. Um, thank you. And just, just finally, the power of right to counsel is in part giving tenants the knowledge that they can stand and fight if they face uh, unfair treatment by a landlord, for example. And uh, we know that um, tenants who don't, are not aware they have an attorney ready to help them sometimes in the face of an eviction proceeding uh, would uh, take a paltry buyout or even in some cases flee the apartment rather than have to confront an eviction. That's particularly true, I think, people who have immigration documentation challenges, et cetera. Um, so informing the public and tenants of the existence of this right is actually extremely important and, and will be now uh, in the post-pandemic phase even more than ever. Can you tell us about the city's effort to make sure that every tenant in New York City knows they have this right? Uh, not necessarily just at the moment that they show up to court for the eviction, but that they know in general that they have this backup um, if there's conflict with their attorney, uh, with their landlord, and, and what we could do to ramp up the scale of that outreach now, given um, what we ex expect to have to deal with post pandemic. I appreciate the, the question. Um, you know, one thing that we've done uh, through that was able to be accelerated and really intensified through the pandemic is work in partnership with the court uh, to ensure that information about uh, availability of legal services in New York City uh, is on uh, every official notification from the court. Uh, that information coming with uh, the imprimatur of the court seal almost, uh, letting tenants know that they have access to legal services and here's how you might, here's how you can find out more about them, uh, has been a really critical piece in getting the word out. Um, I think more broadly, um, as I said, uh, we do have uh, concrete plans for a much broader uh, media based approach around the right to counsel. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, part of the issue there is just understanding what the right kind of timing ought to be and what the right kind of distribution ought to be. And we're working in partnership with the mayor's office on, uh, on, on thinking, that, uh, thinking that through. We look forward to staying in close touch with the council uh, on that as uh, the day grows closer uh, for the release of that. Finally, one thing that we did, knowing that folks are often on the computer and looking for information, is update our website and make it a bit more user friendly, uh, more oriented around uh, the tenant who has questions. Um, this was uh, keeping in the spirit of the city's tenants resource portal, which is hosted by the Mayor's Office to Protect Tenants, which pro provides a lot of information uh, about tenants uh, for tenants with landlord tenant disputes. But for our part, we, up we updated our legal services for tenants page and uh, assigned it a new URL. So tenants with questions about how to access legal services through OCJ can go to nyc.gov slash RTC for right to counsel and access that information. Thank you, and my, my time is up. We, 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 we wanna accelerate outreach to tenants even more and, and Councilmember Gibson and I have a bill which we heard uh, pre prior to the pandemic that would um, require uh, contracting with community-based organizations on the ground to, um, to do this outreach because they're credible messengers and they're in the neighborhoods and they have cultural competency. So uh, that's not the topic of today's hearing, but I just wanna, want to uh, uh, re remind everybody about how important the outreach component is. So I'm way over time. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the extra time. Uh, thank you again to Councilmember Gibson for your partnership and leadership. And thank you, uh, uh, Jordan, for uh, the work that you're doing for this important cause. Thank you, Councilmember. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Gibson. Question time starts now. 
Thank you. Sorry about the delay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councilmember Levine and Jordan, uh, to you and your staff at OCJ. Thank you very much. We had the chance to speak earlier last week about the work that you and your team have been doing during the pandemic. And I'm just reminded of the critical nature of this work. Um, and even in the midst of this global pandemic, the fact that courts are closed, we know that tenants are still facing harassment. Many have fallen behind in rent um, and are really struggling for basic necessities. Um, so I can't emphasize how important this topic is, as well as all of the other issues that we've been talking extensively about around food insecurity, around affordable housing. Um, so I really want to echo the sentiments of Councilmember Levine and just saying that we are grateful. Uh, we've still been working. Our city workers, HRA, DSS, you know, we're all still working uh, to the very best that we can to provide the services that are very critical. So I'm glad you talked in your testimony about the work that's been done during the pandemic um, and certainly supporting the spirit of the bill is a good start. And you know, we're going to keep pushing to get us to the victory line. Uh, but I wanted to ask specifically, um, Council Member Levine in his opening talked about this bill 2050, not adding any additional cost to the implementation of expanding right to council since we're currently in a five year phase in. So number one, I wanted to ask, uh, does the administration believe that there is an additional cost beyond what's already allocated uh, to implement 2050. And then I wanna understand for the broader public and those that are watching, how many zip codes is right to council serving today? And during the pandemic, have you noticed, have you seen any trends in the data collected of additional zip codes that you have been serving that are not in the original and expanded zip code list? And are we looking at some of those trends to see where there are populations and zip codes that would ultimately be served by this bill uh, that are not necessarily in the expansion where we can target now as we look to expand on the zip code cover coverage? So Councilman, I, I appreciate the question because I think it gives me an opportunity to make a few things clear. And of course, I want to first and foremost say thank you for your support for the work of my office, um, and most importantly, for the work being done every day by our legal services provider partners. You know, uh, part of what we've attempted to do is set up the structures that can best uh, connect tenants uh, with the lawyers who can help them. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, it's the lawyers and their teams who are doing the work on behalf of tenants. And I have to acknowledge right. uh, all of the important work that they're doing and their flexibility in working with us and the courts to ensure that uh, in this new normal, uh, whether it's through phone lines or uh, virtual conferences, uh, the legal services are being made available for tenants who need it. With respect to zip codes, um, it was always our intention in the coming fiscal year to do away with zip codes entirely as anything remotely like an eligibility requirement. Uh, fiscal 22 is the last year of our implementation uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we accelerated that process right from the very first day. So the very first thing that we did uh, in seeing that even at a time of very limited activity in housing court, uh, emergency proceedings in which a tenant might be illegally locked out or evicted by their landlord, emergency proceedings in which a tenant uh, is seeking emergency repairs, uh, we eliminated any zip code requirements, made that clear to the providers, made that clear to the court and put in, process, uh, put in a process to, uh, with the housing court to say, anyone who is facing, who is bringing such a case, bring that information to OCJ and we will assign to a lawyer who can help them. Uh, that has been the approach that we have continued throughout. So today, if anyone is facing an eviction proceeding in housing court and appears in housing court, they will uh, have access to uh, uh, legal representation um, uh, regardless of their zip code. We have no intention of returning to a zip code approach. Um, okay. That being said, in answer to your question, we have started to look at the zip code uh, uh, question within the cases that have been handled. Um, those zip codes look roughly similar to the kinds of zip codes that were the highest in the number of eviction proceedings, the highest in the number of uh, cases in which uh, legal services were being provided. But for our purposes now, and I hope for everyone else's, that question is irrelevant. We see this as, as with all due respect, we see this as a uh, citywide effort um, that really has to meet tenants uh, uh, where they are and where they are citywide. 
And so I think the, the goal for us is better understanding uh, what, are the best ways to, what are the best ways to connect tenants with council uh, at a time of great uncertainty as to how people are being connected. And of course, to continue to work in very close partnership with the courts and with the legal services providers to make those processes a success. Okay, I'm so glad to hear that. And I thank you for clarifying that. So it is made clear to the broader public and advocates that no tenants will be turned away from services, uh, regardless of what zip code uh, they live in. Uh, and so I also wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that the legislation before the committee today would not allow the administration the flexibility in terms of providing the services. So doesn't it seem that we are gearing towards that citywide expansion anyway? So what is it about the bill? And we can speak offline about specific uh, legislative language that would prohibit the agency from implementing the full citywide measure that we're already starting to do anyway. You know, I think I think the 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 flexibility has to do with those needs for legal services that may occur sort of outside of the four corners of the right to counsel law. Things like legal assistance and for tenants who are in disputes with uh, landlords but haven't yet been sued or legal, legal services for tenants who need help with hardship declarations or whatever we don't know right now that may come down the pike, be it in the form of needs around the federal moratorium, which right now is only lasting until March, but we don't know. If there's one thing that we have learned throughout this process is that this is a legal landscape that can change on a dime. And that is a very frustrating place for many tenants to be. It's certainly a very frustrating place for many practitioners to be. What we've tried to do throughout is make sure that uh, the stakeholders that we work with have the information as quickly as possible. So many mornings, providers have woken up to getting an order in the email, you know, a new executive order uh, in their email inboxes uh, from us in nearly all circumstances. They had it already because they're good lawyers and they're clued in, but we want to make sure that everybody has the right information. But as a result, we need the opportunity to make sure that we are looking holistically at needs for tenants for legal help and able to address that, uh, those most urgent needs as quickly as possible. And so I, we look forward to further discussions along those lines. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chair, just two very last quick questions, I promise. Um, I appreciate you saying that. And I also think that you know, this pandemic is a reminder of a lot of deficiencies that we have in our system today, but it's also a learning lesson. I think, you know, oftentimes we have to stay ready so we don't have to get ready. Um, and as we're learning this new normal and trying to adjust to this environment we're working in, we have to be very prepared for what lies ahead when the moratorium is lifted and what we know will be an avalanche of cases in housing court. Um, so I also wonder, uh, someone, one of my colleagues talked about language access, which is very important. And you talked about that during the pandemic, making sure that we capture those that are, are non-native English speakers and that speak English as a second language, make sure that we communicate in the way they understand. That is critically important. Um, I wonder how we are capturing those households that have fallen behind in rent, but not yet receiving any eviction notice, right? So they're on the cusp of a pending eviction. How do we reach out to them to allow them an understanding of what services are available? You talked about the website, that's great, but a lot of households don't have internet connection and connectivity. So how do we get to those uh, locations? Are we using home base, HRA doing work? You know, shout out to our administrator, Gary Jenkins and his team, but what, what resources and tools in the toolbox do we have in place to help capture those households that may not already be on our radar? Uh, you know, Aaron, if it's okay, I might turn it to you to just talk a little bit about the agency's communications that have been happening regularly uh, with our partners, both in the elected side and, and CBOs and those, and, and those communications, which have included information about housing court, eviction moratorium, and legal services, as well as the broader context of social services under the SS. That's right. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you, Council Member, for the question. <clears throat> so um, since the start of the pandemic each week, the commissioner has engaged in a call uh, with our elected partners and CBO partners. Um, each week, there's anywhere from 100 to 200 uh, folks on the call. They're able to ask the commissioner direct questions about policies and program changes that have been made over the course of the pandemic. 
uh, both in response to executive orders, agency directed policy change, our ongoing work and engagement with OTDA, the courts, um, and then following those calls, there's an email sent uh, to approximately 4,500 uh, individuals uh, where we share additional information. Um, this includes everything from updates about how to uh, file for enhanced unemployment benefits, how to apply for cash assistance online using Access HRA, how to apply for SNAP, making individuals aware of the increases to benefits. So throughout the course of the pandemic, there's been federal action that has increased the SNAP allocation for individuals and families who are in desperate need of food resources, information about pandemic EBT, which is administered by the state. So we've really tried to, in real time, as best we can, provide information and updates to our elected partners and CBO partners with the understanding that that information would then spread out like a spider web, um, you know, really reaching into the communities. Um, in terms of, of tracking, um, we work through, you know, our normal processes in which uh, individuals are applying for benefits um, and, and applying. Uh, you know, tracking the information in the normal course of work. Um, there are other programs that have been stood up across this agency that certainly fall under the sort of social services umbrella. I'm thinking of the Get Food Initiative, for example. Um, that is not a direct HRA administered program, but our emergency food uh, offices within HRA do work very closely uh, with the Get Food team, again, to make sure that the resources that are available to New Yorkers are making their way into those uh, households that need it. Thank you. And that's very, very helpful to understand. I'm sure I know many of those CBOs that you partner with and speak uh, frequently to. Um, the Get Food NYC program, PEBT, SNAP benefits, health box. I mean, all of that is important because it's not just about the stability of a roof over your head, but it's also about access to other necessities. So I'm glad that you all get it and have been engaging folks on the ground. A lot of these organizations have a continuity of services. They already have relationships. They're already doing some sort of remote services anyway. I think about some of our healthcare providers that are doing uh, home visits, checking on you know medically frail and elderly, and you know those that are living alone, um, very 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 isolated during the pandemic. So that's good to hear. The final question I have is related to the one shot deal. Um, and I wanted to understand what the agency is doing to make any reforms to one-shot deals in the middle of this climate, knowing that there's an economic uh, hardship for so many families to meet the monthly rent with stagnant wages, loss of income. Um, how can we reform the one-shot deal program? The eviction filing requirement, are we loosening some of those things? Like, are we working with our state partners to look at any opportunities to make it easier for clients to access one-shot deals um, as a way to help them with a lot of the back rent that they are facing? Sure, so I'll start and then maybe um, my colleague, Mr. Jordan, will jump in. Um, we've certainly engaged in ongoing conversations with, with OTDA and our partners uh, throughout the pandemic in terms of where we're able to um, you know, loosen eligibility requirements or, or suspend eligibility requirements to make sure that um, we are getting you know, the necessary resources to the individuals who need it. Um, those conversations have both been successful in the terms of OTDA um, granting particular waivers. Um, I think the, the waiver for the cash assistance interview by telephone um, is, is a major one. Um, and then there have been waivers that we've requested from the state that have been denied. For example, um, we requested um, the state FAHEPS eligibility to be changed so that way um, an individual does not have to have the eviction proceeding, right? If there's eviction of moratorium, a client isn't facing an eviction proceeding and therefore is found ineligible for state FAHEPS. That particular waiver from the state was denied. Um, we continue these conversations to try to make sure that, again, we are looking at, um, you know, the statutory requirements and regulatory requirements and seeing where we can work with our partners um, to make those changes. And I'll turn over to Bruce if he has anything to add. Yeah, I, I would just add uh, very briefly that what you just pointed out, FEPS has always had the requirement based on a loss <laughs> going back to Jiggets and the Pena settlement, mm -hmm. but the one-shot deal has never had a requirement for legal action. It's always been a misnomer sometimes, unfortunately, but 
The basic criteria for a one-shot deal is you all rent, you have proof that you all rent from a landlord, it doesn't have to be a court stipulation. And if you have a reasonable future plan to pay your rent, we can assess you. Okay, thank you. Well, anything that we've asked the state of that's been denied, that's just a setback. A setback is preparation for a comeback. So let's try again. And certainly using us, the relationships we have with our colleagues in Albany, this is a new year, a new chapter new administration. So I say, you know, let's try to get these, um, you know, these hurdles addressed so that we can make it easier for our clients in the middle of a pandemic. So um, I'm done with questions. My time is up, but I really thank all of you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Erin and Jordan and the HRA team, the DSS team, the OCJ team, uh, every acronym. <laughs> thank you guys really for the work you're doing. Um, it does not go unnoticed and unrecognized and working with all of our civil legal service providers on the ground, many whom I've of whom I've talked to. I know that this has not been an easy time, but I appreciate the impact that we are making. And we ha just have to keep pushing because the reality is there are a lot of tenants out there that need our support and need our uh, priority and our attention. And we cannot lose sight of that right now. So I am looking forward to working with you. We're going to get to the victory line on 2050. I'm sure of it. Um, and I appreciate you, Jordan, for uh, coming today and really everything that you and your team have done uh, during the course of this pandemic. So thank you so much. And thank you, Chair Levin, for allowing me the additional time. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Gibson, um, I just want to uh, apologize in advance. My kids just got home, so you might hear some cacophony in the background. Um, uh, 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 Bruce, before I turn it over to Council Member Prudentic, I wanted to ask you one quick question. Um, <clears throat> Being that the limitations to one shots are what you just outlined, um, you know, presumably um, there are many tenants that uh, would would qualify much more than um, than than the city has the resources to accommodate. How how would we be um, uh, assessing one shot applications? Um, under the kind of pre-existing uh, standard that um, that, uh, that you know we had prior to COVID. I mean, if the standards are that they're able to pay, uh, you know, they don't need an eviction proceeding. Um, they they just have to demonstrate that they could pay the rent moving forward. And you know, they were paying up until, I mean, just as a scenario or a hypothetical paying their rent up until uh, COVID and then, um, you know, lost their employment during COVID, um, uh, you know, accrued arrears. Um, but once once we're out of the pandemic, they're able to, um, to work full time and continue to pay their rent. You know, that, that, that seems like a fairly common scenario that we can anticipate. What's the limitations of, of one shots in that, in that scenario? So thank you for that question, Chair Levin. I think that uh, we would probably have to go back to applying some of the other criteria. I maybe have made it just seem a little too simple, but the main criteria is that are mandatory. Obviously, you have to have proof of your rent arrears, obviously, right? And you have to have the future plan. But one of the things we take into account all along is what was the reason that you fell into arrears, right? Just can't be a story. Hopefully there's some documentation, some form of a hardship, less of mismanagement. Uh, also the amount of arrears, right? At a certain point, it's probably more feasible to have someone relocate than stay, depending on the affordability of the housing. There's a lot of other little complicated factors that go into an assessment or evaluation every day. So I guess if we ever reach that type of uh, dilemma where the state and city funding, yes, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask. So that sorry. was my son, actually. Oh, yeah, that was my son. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess we ask, had to start, start well, shaving things down if, if all of a sudden the funding become came unavailable, even at the uh, pre-pandemic level. We would just have to take a stricter look, I guess, within the current program rubric that we do. But the most uh, main mandatory things are a future ability and just proof of the arrears. But we do now, take into uh, consideration of the factors. Wouldn't it make sense? Wouldn't it make sense to just um, uh, take the federal stimulus dollars um, 
hopefully more would be coming in in, in the in the upcoming um, uh, stimulus deal from the Biden administration, and just take take those stimulus dollars and up uh, and apply them to rent arrears through the one shot program. Uh, well, didn't that make a lot of sense? So uh, Chair Eleven, that's what uh, I believe uh, myself and Aaron sort of testified. That's that's the sort of the direction of the conversations with the state. Okay, I mean, I would prefer to advocate that they don't reinvent the wheel. We have a pretty effect. I mean, I will say this, and anyone that asks me, you know, what has been the most meaningful um, uh, work that, that the Blasio administration has done around homelessness, and I'll say, um, civil legal services, the increase of civil legal services. And the increase in one shots, which has you know stabilized a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, tenants across New York City. Um, you know, just to put into context, I mean, you know, prior to 2014, you know, there were six million dollars in civil legal services in the city of New York under the Bloomberg. Six million dollars, and then it, it, you know, this administration has brought it up to over 60, 70, 80 million dollars um, uh, annually. Um, and but the but the uh, expansion of of one shots and the eligibility of one shots has been um, has been transformational with this from last administration to this administration. So certainly that's something that that I think we can advocate for is, is you know again not reinventing the wheel here, um, but uh, perhaps bolstering the system that's been so effective um, for the last eight years. Seven years. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll turn it over to Casper Grudenchik now. Time starts now. I'm going to ask for an extra five minutes in advance. I'm only kidding. Thank you, Chair Levin. Um, I, you kind of took my questions because we usually anticipate each other's line of questioning. Um, but I, and I want to thank HRA uh, not only for being here today, but for their comprehensive testimony. And um, I really think, uh, and my comments are going to um, riff on uh, Chair Levin uh, mostly and to some extent. Uh, Council Member Gibson's uh, comments. I really believe that um, that we have to play long ball here and we have to look down the field because this pandemic has been going on for almost a year. And um, the use of one shots, I agree with Chair Levin, uh, is probably the best thing that we have done to prevent homelessness. And we know that so much, um, so many of the things that we, we fight against as a city and this council and the administration have worked on uh, stem from preventing homelessness. Those kind of, it goes a long way, uh, it affects uh, the education of children, it affects so many different things. And uh, I know um, that a question was asked, I think by Chair Levin about what we're exactly looking at. And if you don't have the answer today, um, that's okay, because there's still time to come up with an answer. I think that we really need um, with, with due respect to HRA and Department of Social Services, we need to take a hard look at what it's going to cost um, because we, are, we, can't, uh, we can't print money here, but the federal government does. And we finally have an administration in place that is willing to look at these issues very seriously. Um, and I would respectfully request um, that we do get a hard look from HRA uh, to see exactly what we're up against, because you really can't deal with this problem until you know how, exactly how many people are going to be facing eviction. And um, the the one shot takes a is it over a, allowed four months in arrears? Um, can can you answer that question? That's the one question I will ask. So, Council uh, Member, the the traditional one shot deal administered by uh, HRA with oversight from the state. There is no limit as far as the money. Okay. Okay. It's by case by case basis. So um, I think that the number of cases that you're dealing with is going to rapidly expand. Uh, many people, we still have a double digit unemployment rate in all of New York City. And uh, that's nobody's fault. Um, there was a pandemic and we're still fighting it. And um, I, I really think it is critical that we come up with a number and maybe. We can discuss this again at a future hearing if uh, Chair Levin is so inclined. Um, but we really need to know what we're up against. And this crisis is still unfolding. The numbers are still uh, daunting. Um, and we really need to know what we are up against. So 
Uh, I'm not going to ask any questions except to request from HRA that they go back to the table and really take a hard look. Are we dealing with 10,000? Uh, probably not. Are we dealing with 100,000? Much more likely. Um, the numbers are uh, just off the charts. Uh, we yeah. know how many. Yes, Aaron. Oh, Councilmember, sorry to interrupt. Um, I was going to say it might be a good time now to just jump in with some information about okay. uh, rent arrears payments that have been made. Um, to your point, in terms of, of tracking this, um, in FY uh, fiscal year 19, um, the city had a 255 million total expenditure in rent arrears, and that served about uh, approximately 57, almost 58,000 households. Um, and then in uh, city fiscal year 20, um, it was about 215 million. Um, so, a, you know, a, a slight decline serving about um, almost 50,000 households. Um, the average payment year over year was approximately the same. Um, and this is data that we, you know, continue to look at. Um, I think very much to your point, um, you know, this administration really um, took the payment of rent arrears, um, made it more accessible to clients, made it something that individuals who were in need of this uh, were made aware of, um, and then our ability to, to pay that out based on uh, the, the state criteria. Um, so we'll continue uh, to track and monitor that as one metric. Again, it's one of many of the prevention tools that we have in, in the toolkit that we have, but wanted to get that on the record. I, I thank you for that. That's that's very helpful to me because it gives us some idea. But um, if there's any way that we can try to look forward working uh, with advocates and, and the other uh, folks that you work with, thank you. Um, that would be helpful because right now they're planning, you know, the next stimulus package. And I am certain that New York City is not alone in this. Uh, we will have many allies, but we've got to be um, we also have, thankfully, the new Senate Majority Leader. So we do have a lot of allies. Now is the time, um, but we don't want to get caught short. So I just wanted to put all that on the record. I thank you, Chair. I thank uh, HRA uh, for your work and for being here today and testifying uh, as you have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Prudentic. Uh, I'll turn it now over to Councilmember Helen Rosen. Time starts now. Great, thanks so much. Um, uh, I appreciate all the hard work, council members um, Levine and Gibson, congratulations always on this brilliant legislation. And of course, congratulations to the Right to Council Coalition. Um, two quick questions. Uh, one from my staff is, uh, is our, our holdovers, um, uh, our holdover cases uh, allowed uh, to be taken by Right to Council lawyers? Uh, Yes, uh, thank you, council member. Um, the, the answer is yes. Uh, holdover proceedings in housing court, which is to say an eviction proceeding brought for a reason other than non-payment of rent uh, are included under uh, the existing right to counsel law. And in fact, uh, a subset of holdover proceedings, uh, those cases in which the allegation is uh, something in the spirit of a nuisance case or a threat to the health and safety, if those are the allegations, then the current state law and the current statewide administrative order allows those cases to proceed even now in the midst of the, uh, the, the ban on nearly every eviction. And so as a result, uh, we have worked with the legal providers uh, and the courts to ensure access to legal representation in that small number of cases that are currently being heard. Oh, so helpful. Do you have a sense of the percentage of cases that are holdover? Traditionally, right yeah, council. sure. Yeah. Um, without having one of our many reports directly in front of me, uh -huh. so this is from memory, and I recognize them under oath. Um, I, I believe. You thank you, council member. Um, uh, holdovers have traditionally accounted for, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of like fifteen percent 
of uh, citywide okay. eviction proceedings one five. However, I don't want I don't want things to get confused. Nuisance holdovers, so to speak, um, are not the entirety of that fifteen percent because there could be a holdover for overstaying a lease or any other kind of reasons. That fifteen percent. Uh, okay. Mike. You know, my guess is that the reason my staff wanted me to ask this question is because my district zip codes have not been eligible for right to counsel and just wanting to make sure now going forward, given that the zip codes in my district um, are eligible, that we'll be able to um, assure those cases will be taken by right to counsel lawyers as well. Um, and then I have a budget nerd question, which is have, if you look at uh, fiscal years, the budget for right to counsel fiscal years 20 versus 21, would, would the budget, are there fewer cases that given the eviction moratorium that right to counsel lawyers have to take. So therefore has the budget for that line decreased? You know, they, it's, a, it's a very good question. Thank you for the question. Um, there were uh, one-time savings uh, taken um, in the, the OCJ access to counsel budget in fiscal 20 and then again in fiscal year 21 that were uh, based on just the traditional delays in, um, uh, in hiring and onboarding by legal yeah. services staff, uh, I'm sorry, legal services organizations um, of the necessary staff. Um, uh, and so uh, those were one time, I think those, those delays were exacerbated in the middle of the pandemic with just all the challenges with onboarding. However, as we head into fiscal year 22, um, we are fully funded and we fully expect to be at uh, full implementation uh, for fiscal year 22. Okay, so, you, so the nonprofits have not had the management problem of having to lay people off because no. there wasn't enough work. No, absolutely okay. not. A absolutely right. not. And in fact, right. um, providers have seen increases uh, uh, every year. And with further increases, uh, substantial increases in fiscal year 22, which we are just starting to nail down and gonna have those conversations with providers uh, very soon and probably earlier with respect to uh, any uh, sort of fiscal year cycle than we ever have before. You know, when I think about the police overtime budget and trying to- Time expired. If I could just sort of finish this thought. Um, yeah, of, of course, Councilor. Um, finish finish your line, line of questioning. It's uh, because there's, I don't think there's any other uh, members that are asking. Thank you so much, Chair Levin. Always a pleasure working with you. Um, but I'm just wondering when you think about the police overtime budget and reining it in. You know, it's challenging because if there's overtime, there's overtime. So you're just going to reimburse it. Can we, on a happier face, note that for um, one shot and for funding right to counsel, are those things driven by demand or is it ever the case that, you know, as the city has faced financial troubles over the last year, that we've limited allocations due to fiscal belt tightening? I'll speak to legal services first. Um, the but what you just described, belt tightening in the face of uh, the fiscal, uh, fiscal pressures um, has only occurred in the last two years with respect to legal services, but only to the extent of taking one-time savings out of a budget that was not yet allocated. Um, the legal services providers um, had, were, were not, uh, their contracts were not affected, their ability to expand in those fiscal years was not affected. And we do not see that on the horizon for fiscal year 22, uh, when full implementation is going to be um, uh, the part of our plan. Um, uh, so that, that I believe is the answer for uh, legal services. Great. Um, and uh, same answer for arrears. 
So, council member, I had shared the uh, the arrears information um, earlier in terms of the yes. fiscal year for 19 and 20, um, and that yeah. is based on um, an eligibility. Okay, so there's never any, there hasn't been any like hold up because of budget constraints, you know, kind of like with the contract payments, you know, the city has slowed down payments to nonprofits depending on how much money is cash on hand. Is this, and I'm just wondering if the same is true for, um, you know, one shots. I can have uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Jordan, respond, but that's not the case. Okay, sounds like, uh, go ahead. Yes, so uh, council member, uh, as Aaron was saying, it's, it's, it's not the case. It's my understanding that the one-shot deal uh, allocations come from the TANF and safety net uh, allocations from the state. And the city in the past, like the city BEPS, has stepped in where it can with like city FEPS red arrears under CTL. Oh, right, good point. So that's where there might be, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your hard work on this very successful program. Congratulations. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask um, some, some, a few questions here before, uh, before we wrap up. And my son decided not to take a nap, so he's with us here as well. Um, wait for my computer. Um, um, has has uh, DSS or um, uh, agencies within the administration um, sat down and done like tabletop exercises around um, the moratorium ending, kind of, you know, gaming out scenarios in which um, so there's kind of a, um, you know, game plan in place. Is that something that you've done or um, something you intend to do? You know, for our part, in terms of uh, gearing up for an eventual end to uh, uh, the, the housing court closure, um, you know, we've had discussions with legal services providers about sort of different forms that the service response can take, uh, trying to better understand um, sort of, uh, you know, what the, uh, what the accessibility for legal services can and ought to look like depending on what the scenario is. I think the challenge with all of this is all of the input, so to speak, on what uh, an exercise like that uh, might be uh, tend to change given a 30 day time period. And then something, you know, it becomes something different at that point. And uh, it becomes a very challenging exercise to uh, sort of predict the, the wide variation um, of uh, different scenarios. The one thing that we do know is uh, that the old way of doing business in housing court where you know, thousands if not tens of thousands of people are called to housing court you know, essentially two times a day you know, at 9.30 and then again at 2.15 uh, for uh, what amount to mass calendar calls uh, with milling about in the hallways and waiting um, is uh, unlikely to return anytime soon. And uh, a somewhat newly developed way of doing business with scheduled calendar calls uh, that right now tied to virtual conferencing, which have to be scheduled at appointed times, um, is the new way of doing business. And so it's afforded us a lot of opportunity to really think through uh, new ways of making legal services available uh, to those who don't have uh, counsel in court, um, as well as for legal services providers to provide effective representation to the clients that they already have. Um, and understanding, of course, that, you know, there's only a limit to, there's a limit to how many of any particular kind of matter or any particular kind of case the courts can hear at any particular time. So uh, the only thing I would add to that council member, Chair Levin, uh, is that 
because of the Office of Civil Justice and our connection with OCA and the courts. And the fact that, as you said, we have a program that's not broke in the traditional one-shot deal programs. To date, other entities have invited us to the table from whether it be City Hall or whether it be OTADA to start having some discussions, yes, on planning. Okay, yeah, I would definitely recommend, um, you know, maybe City Hall being the convener of, um, you know, of a kind of ongoing exercise meeting once a month or so reviewing, um, you know, getting, getting um, you know, a fairly large table, you know, so you have uh, reps from o uh, OTDA, you have reps from OCA, and, um, uh, and, and the, the civil legal services providers, um, uh, as well as the city agencies to, to kind of game out as this, because, you know, so that there's a kind of continuity. Um, obviously, you can't predict exactly where um, things will be from the federal government's perspective, but you certainly could, could uh, you know, make an informed uh, uh, assessment of, of where city and state policy will be, um, particularly if you have, um, you know, OCA and, o and OTDA there. Um, so that would be my recommendation is kind of having kind of getting this um, collaborative process in place, um, uh, you know, uh, starting starting now so that uh, so you can anticipate this. And I'll just, I'll note council member also through the, the IHAC, the Interagency Homelessness Accountability Council, um, we spent months this year uh, in the quarterly meetings that were acquired by local law um, discussing some of these very topics. Uh, representatives from this agency, uh, from HRA, were involved in those meetings, as well as other agency partners from ACS, from DOE, from DOHMH, HPD, um, and as well as um, uh, the Center for Innovation for Data Intelligence, MOYA. Um, so that was that was one, one piece. I do hear the point of the chair, and I'm certainly happy to bring that back uh, to, to City Hall and to colleagues and the inclusion of our, our CBO partners, of course. Thank you. Um, what is the city doing um, around advocacy for, you know, the, the uh, cancel rent advocacy at the state level? Is, is there, is the city involved in that or is the city considered legislation or looked at the legislation that's currently pending in the, in the legislature around cancel rent? Um, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we are very much aware of the fact that the, you know, COVID-19 has caused so much uncertainty across the city. Um, we've been advocating at the state level, at the federal level to, um, you know, get the relief that uh, New Yorkers need in the way of the eviction moratoria, the, uh, you know, increased rental assistance, um, advocating for additional food resources, enhanced unemployment benefits, and those sorts of things. Um, we have, um, you know, spoken today about the, the tenant legal services, um, and we want to continue to explore um, those conversations and making sure um, to get the relief in the hands of renters so that they are able to pay their rent. Um, I think at the, at the end of the day, that is what we need to be focused on. Um, you know, making sure that the monies that have already been allocated are able to quickly be dispersed. Um, and so folks are able, um, you know, to cover their rent, um, landlords can make their payments and so on. Um, how is DSS working with um, people who are undocumented uh, when it comes to providing um, uh, rental assistance either through um, state, state program or city program? Sure, so I can start and then turn it over maybe to, to Jordan and to Bruce to speak specifically about the programs. Um, we administer programs based on state and federal statute as it relates to eligibility criteria for individuals who are undocumented. Um, early on in the COVID pandemic, uh, we partnered um, with 
nonprofit organizations and through uh, philanthropic organizations, namely the Open, Sci Open Societies Foundation um, to administer donations through the Mayor's Fund for the Immigrant Emergency Relief Program, recognizing that through existing statute, many New Yorkers would be cut out from the you know, very real uh, programs that they would need in order to pay rent, um, put food on the table. Um, and so we've worked directly with them. Um, and so as Jordan has mentioned, the OCJ programs are available to New Yorkers irrespective of immigration status. Um, and the programs uh, that Bruce and his team uh, administer do have eligibility criteria that sometimes do include, uh, a, a, excuse me, an immigrant uh, immigration status uh, that would they be, individual, excuse me, would be excluded if they did not have the requisite uh, immigration status. So one shot, one shots are those are, are those available to um, to undoc undocumented tenants and um, the uh, the federal dollars through the stimulus that have come through are those available to um, so specifically uh, those two examples are those available to people that are undocumented? They are not. Now, why wouldn't the state one be, uh, or why, why wouldn't one shots be? One shots, are they using, are they drawing down federal funds? So um, it's interesting that you should ask. So the, so the provision of federal law requires that states make a determination for state and local dollars to be made available um, to individuals who are undocumented. Um, there are states, uh, Texas, Florida, California, who, um, have extended this provision into their state law. Um, New York has not yet done that. There's a bill in the state legislature um, that Senator Prasad introduced in Assemblymember Cruz um, that would you know, extend the ability for state and local dollars to be used um, for individuals irrespective of immigration status. But at this point, based on, on federal law and existing state law, um, those dollars can't be used. So according to New York state law, because we're allowed, because other there's no federal. Again, these are these are these are state tax dollars and city tax dollars. Um, they're not um, TANF funds, right? So, I mean, Bruce can talk more about this. I mean, the one shot yeah. funding stream does come through um, through TANF. There are some. TANF oh, it does. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But the state has the authority. To be able to, to to waive those requirements as California, Texas, and Florida have done, is what you're saying? That's correct, and we can get you um, the federal statute. Um, okay. And can share the the state legislation as well. Okay. Is the administration in support of that state legislation? Um, so the administration is is looking at that. Yes. Okay. Um, well, that I mean, I'll have to take a look at the legislation, but I. I, I think that that's going to be uh, an essential component here. If we can't, if people who are undocumented are not, can't be, can't avail themselves. You know, if we go down the road of, of, of using the apparatus of one shots to be able to, um, uh, you know, help people meet these rent arrears and, you know, upwards of a billion and one, $1.2 billion worth of rent, rent arrears. If, if, un, if people who are undocumented don't have access to that. Right. And you know, as I mentioned, I mean, under under COVID, um, we were able to, you know, New York City was able to administer the immigrant uh, emergency relief program, um, and then there's also, I mean, not fully excluded, but um, in you know mixed status households, um, you know, the availability for these programs um, is possible. Okay, that's something that we should definitely be focusing on. Then I think. Um, can one shots be used to cover arrears for storage units? I could certainly speak from just personal experience uh, the, the number of times that uh, clients that we've worked with in my office have had storage units and faced challenges around um, arrears there. I'm gonna have Bruce jump in here. Sorry, you're muted, Bruce. I think um, there you go. 
No, he's big. Okay, guys. sorry about that. I, I have some company in my house now, too. Um, yes, uh, you can get storage arrears through a local uh, job center and applying on Access HRA. It is available. And, uh, and arrears are also for utilities, too. So the main things are rent, storage, and utilities. And that and would be wanna, available yeah, even if it was an expanded program uh, that would be available. In other words, if we're if if, if, if we're using uh, one shots or if there is any uh, or whatever program the city pursues when it comes to um, providing arrears from COVID, will one shot uh, will um, storage units be part of that equation? So I, I'm not an expert in the law, but when I I think I looked it over this morning and it mentioned rent arrears and utilities. I don't know if the stimulus allows or doesn't allow storage. I don't know that. But okay. traditional one shot deals, HRA, OTA does allow that. Okay. What well, what were you you were looking at the state state law this morning or city federal law? The federal law? Yeah, the actual yeah, the stimulus bill itself. I was looking okay. at a piece okay. related to just the uh funding. Got it. Got and it. the criteria, yes. Right. And I don't know, I'm I'm not I'm not so certain too whether or not it someone has to check this, whether or not uh immigration status is a factor. I think it might not have been a factor in the, and someone might have been sleeping in the feds. So we need to double check that. Okay, okay. Um, okay, well, this is something obviously we should really be um, working out over the, over the coming weeks. Um, uh, uh, last question for me here. Um, do, um, how are we looking at the, system of home base um, in in all of this. Um, uh, uh, Bruce, you've been very involved with home base. Um, uh, how, how is home base man, how is home base pro, um, uh, doing their work right now? And how will they, how do we envision them um, uh, being part of this solution? Oh, currently they're they're an integral partner, and I'll I'll defer to Deputy Commissioner Zita B, who's on the call. Sure. Hi. Thanks for the question. Um, so Home Base um, very quickly and efficiently was able to transition a lot of their work um, remotely. They got everybody equipment. They figured out how to do um, remote visits and signatures and gather documents. So they have continued to enroll um, right at their targeted enrollment rates this entire time. Um, they tend to rotate staff in maybe once a week. So they do have some in office services for some really urgent matters or if they have to hand off checks and things like that. Um, so they have been um, um, you know, delivering all, you know, all the home-based services, aftercare, helping people renew. Um, certainly we would imagine that they would help um, um, HRA tenants who might be on our subsidies or their general prevention clients with um, applying for any stimulus dollars that may apply um, may apply to them. Um, and then also, this is not directly related to us, but they have been running the Project Parachute FASTEN program, which was um, funded by private dollars and um, runs through the enterprise community partners and goes to these home-based programs and they raise millions of dollars that could specifically be used for undocumented families for arrears. So um, all of those home-based providers have been also um, getting that program up and running and um, processing arrears grants for undocumented families that can't get that money anywhere else. Okay, th thank you very much, um, Sarah. Um, the, uh, yeah, lastly, I just wanna just acknowledge the, um, uh, the work that this administration has done um, and this HRA you know, under, under Commissioner Banks' leadership for setting up um, Access HRA and various um, remote portals and, and being able to take as much, um, I mean, obviously um, questions around, um, um, you know, uh, workforce sites and, and making sure that we're continuing to accommodate people that don't have access to the, to the technology. Um, but the, but um, you know, I, I shudder to think what, what this would have been like going through this pandemic had we not had um, that system up and running for, you know, and, and having a lot of the, the kinks worked out um, prior to this. And so that, you know, I just want to acknowledge uh, that effort and, um, you know, and acknowledge that it's, it's, it's made a significant um, 
impact in terms of of, uh, of the ease in which people have been able to, to transition to this this remote environment. So, we will um, certainly pass that along to, to the team here. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll let you all go. Oh, sorry, one last question. I think, how are we looking, how are we anticipating um, the influx with the shelter system um, and um, shelter capacity, both on the family side and the, and the single adult side? And, and um, you know, what are we, how are we, how, how is uh, the capacity um, team at DHS and the facilities team at DHS, you know, examining this and looking at this? Sure. So um, thank you for the question. I mean, I think that part of our analysis and work is our continuation to focus on prevention first as sort of, you know, the first pillar of the mayor's turning the tide plan, making sure that there's the requisite investments in the Office of Civil Justice, that we're paying the rent arrears, that we're keeping people in their home, that we're quickly getting folks connected to uh, rental assistance and so on and so forth. Um, the capacity team at DHS every day, irrespective of COVID, is looking at our census, looking at the trends across time to make sure that there's, um, you know, a, a good vacancy rate across the shelter system to account for any influx. Um, we continue um, and have throughout the course of this entire year to continue to announce and notify on shelters under the Mayor's Turning the Tide Plan. We've announced on 88 of the 90 uh, that have been discussed under that plan and we continue um, to make good on the commitments to make sure that every community board is playing their part. Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll continue to look at the trends as, as things in the, the environment in which we're doing this work change, eviction moratorium are lifted, more you know, resources, stimulus bills are passed, we'll continue to, to monitor and evaluate. Thank you, uh, thank you, Deputy, Deputy Commissioner. Um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll let you all go. Um, last question: Are, you, are we do? Is the is the hope count happening this year? Uh, yes, the hope count is happening this year. It is happening across multiple days. Um, our providers, uh, coupled with DHS and DSS staff, will be conducting the count this year. Okay, all right. Um, I wish you all luck. Sarah was always my my uh, site site leader, so. Um, Okay. If, uh, well, certainly we wish you wish you well with that. Um, and uh, and with that, thank you all so much. And um, you, good to see you all. And um, uh, let's let's definitely keep in touch. And let's let's try to set up a kind of um, ongoing exercise for the, the various agencies to um, to think through the the um, the various scenarios that could that we could encounter. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin. So we have concluded DSS's testimony and we are now going to turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that we are gonna call up individuals in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you will begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember there, that there is a few seconds of a delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. So please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before you start your testimony. The first panel of public testimony in the order of speaking will be Nigel Murphy, Lisbeth Moscosa, and Ariel Ashtamker. And I will now call on Nigel Murphy. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hello. Can we can hear you. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, for allowing me to give my testimony. Um, I reside at 5421 Beverly Road and how everything got started for me in my building was when calls were going unanswered and ignored. Tenant leader, a tenant leader in my building <coughs> started having meetings for us to meet up and to talk about the complaints that were going unnoticed. And, um, when we weren't getting the service that we needed, we reached out to the Flatbush Tenant Coalition who came out and hooked us up with uh, the Brooklyn Legal Services and attorneys came out to sit down and educate us and meet with us individually to just let us know our rights and did all the paperwork for us 
which was uh, came very handy for us because a lot of us didn't know what to do and many tenants had to work. So with paperwork being taken care of, we were allowed to um, go in and do what we had to do knowing we had someone to rely on. And when the court dates and all the paperwork was given, we had to show up in court. Now, from my experience going to court, it was very, it was, it was an experience that it, I, I would never wanna do again because we had legal representation and many tenants in there represented themselves. And a lot of the landlords had attorneys. Many didn't show. And I really felt bad for tenants that took the time off from work. Many don't have days where they can use like I did, sick days and vacation days, and they had to reschedule. And many of them felt defeated. And I saw the emotional stress that was on them, feeling happy someone was gonna hear their story and help them out, but knowing there was a no-show to reschedule and also just feeling like there's no one to help me. And the paperwork is confusing. And a lot of them just give up and move out. But thank God for Flatbush Tenant Coalition and the attorneys that helped us out because we rescheduled and we fought our attorney because he didn't want to do the work to fulfill the complaints that we had rights, upgrades in the building. And to make it short, we had things fixed in our buildings. The city came through to us. The attorneys checked in to see if things were done and also with the city. And now things are better. So I'm very thankful and I didn't even know my zip code did not, I was not, I, I, we were not able to get attorneys, but thank goodness for the Brooklyn Legal Services and the Flatbush Tenant Coalition for helping us out and educating us where we can help others. And I continue Time to work expired. with the Flatbush Tenant Coalition. So intro 2050 is needed and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Nigel. I will now call on Elizabeth Moscosa. Time starts now. Hello. Hello, my name is Lisbeth Moscosa. Today I prefer to speak in Spanish because it is the language of all my neighbors whom I represent. So, uh, mi nombre es Lisbeth Moscosa, inquilina líder con BRG Inquilinos Unidos y Catholic Migration Services. Estoy aquí para testificar a favor de Intro 2050, lo que requeriría una implementación inmediata del derecho a representación. Yo soy inquilina de un departamento de renta estabilizada localizado en Queens, donde he vivido por 16 meses. Para mí es importante permanecer en mi hogar porque tengo dos hijos pequeños que necesitan tener la seguridad de vivienda de un hogar para poder satisfacer sus necesidades básicas. Si un inquilino como yo se encuentra enfrentando un desalojo, tener el derecho a un abogado es fundamental para poder quedarse en su hogar. En mi caso, he necesitado de reparaciones que antes de tener un abogado no me atrevía a mencionarlas o no me sentía con el derecho a pedirlas. Además, la, debido a la situación del COVID, nuestros ingresos familiares han disminuido y no hemos podido pagar la renta. Y si el dueño nos lleva a la corte por esta situación, sabemos que tenemos el respaldo de los abogados que están trabajando con nuestra asociación. Por último, gracias al respaldo y a la asesoría de los abogados, pudimos obtener el contrato de renta a nuestro nombre y de esta manera evitar que el dueño tuviera más pretexto para desalojarnos. Es importante que la ciudad haya pasado la ley de derecho a representación, pero todavía debe hacer más para asegurarse que todos los inquilinos tengan y usen este derecho, especialmente durante una crisis económica y de salud eh, a nivel mundial. Intro 2050 le daría a todos los inquilinos elegibles de la ciudad de Nueva York el derecho a un abogado y así poder tener el apoyo y las herramientas necesarias para defender su hogar, apoyo con el que algunos ya contamos. Pero, pero por eso, pensando en todo lo que pudieran estar sintiendo, me pongo en el lugar de las personas que no cuentan con la ayuda y el respaldo de un abogado y estoy segura de que eso me haría sentir temerosa, insegura, desamparada, sola, y es injusto. Todos deberíamos de tener las mismas oportunidades y derechos. El bienestar de la familia no se debe dejar a la suerte. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisbeth. I'll now call on Ariel Ashtemker. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Ariel Shankar, and I'm here on behalf of Communities Resist. Communities Resist is a community-based legal services organization in North Brooklyn, founded on the understanding that housing justice is racial justice, and that legal services must be in support of community-based tenant organizing. Today, we submit testimony in solidarity with the Right to Counsel, of which, or the Right to Counsel Coalition, of which we are a proud member, and in enthusiastic support of Intro 2050 and the immediate citywide implementation of the Right to Counsel. Right to Counsel, or Local Law 136, has made it a right for income eligible tenants facing eviction to have an attorney. Given the ongoing public health and economic crises due to COVID 19, the original phase in plan under Local Law 136 is insufficient to meet the growing need across the city for the immediate implementation of the right to counsel. It is clear that the right to counsel has worked to prevent evictions in New York City. The right to counsel has increased tenants access to legal representation in housing court. As mentioned, in 2013, only 1% of tenants in housing court across the city had legal representation. Today, that percentage is 38% because of the right to counsel. In addition, during the first three years of the right to counsel in New York City, 86% of tenants who had a right to counsel attorney won their case and stayed in their homes. Given the unprecedented number of eviction tenants across the city will soon face as a CDC and state moratorium expire, the need becomes even more urgent for the immediate implementation of the right to counsel across the city. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, nearly 1.5 million New Yorkers have been left unable to pay rent. And many of the more than 200,000 cases currently paused by the existing moratoria will soon be allowed to move forward in a little over a month. Unless the city immediately implements the right to counsel, thousands of tenants across New York City will face eviction and possible homelessness. Now more than ever, New York City tenants need the right to counsel implemented citywide to ensure that they are able to remain in their homes and communities. We call upon the city council to take immediate action to keep New Yorkers in their homes. It makes sense to pass intro 2050 and immediately implement the right to counsel across the city. First, intro 2050 will save the city millions of dollars in shelter, healthcare, and other costs that would otherwise accrue when families are evicted. Second, without intro 2050, there is no permanent guarantee that tenants facing evictions regardless of their zip code, can access an attorney. Third, the current pause on eviction cases does not extend to nuisance cases. Since these cases are able to move forward more quickly, it is even more crucial for tenants facing evictions in a nuisance case to have the right to counsel. Lastly, the right to counsel helps preserve the city's affordable housing stock by keeping long-term rent-stabilized tenants in their homes. Time expired. For these and other reasons, we believe the right to counsel should be immediately implemented across the city. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ariel. I'm now gonna call on our next panel. The next panel in the following order will be Josefa Silva, Eric Lee, and Gajtana Simonovsky. Over to Josefa. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Levin and council, member, council members of the General Welfare Committee. My name is Josefa Silva and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at WIN. Since April at WIN, we've been sounding the alarm on the need to prepare for the inevitable homelessness fallout of the pandemic. We've called for rent relief and for proven interventions to keep families in their homes, as well as for reforming New York City's rental assistance program so New Yorkers in shelter can leave more quickly for stable housing. Thank you for bringing us together around these issues that are essential to New York's economic recovery and to ensuring it is an equitable one. The city's most pressing task today is to ensure a quick, efficient, and fair rollout of federal rent relief funds. DSS can avoid the most common pitfalls by partnering with community-based organizations. By involving CBOs in setting the rent relief program's parameters and giving them discretion in implementation, the program will truly meet New Yorkers where they are before they fall through the cracks and into shelter. 
but the rent relief funding that will soon be on its way from the federal government is not enough to meet the scope of need of our city. So the city must prepare to pick up where the federal funds will leave off, and that will include helping families who do lose their homes. DXS must expand its rapid rehousing program and strengthen it through partnership with HPD to connect households with housing that's vacant today. To additionally ensure that homelessness is brief, DSS must also strengthen the city's existing rental voucher program. City FEPS is meant to be a path out of shelter, but as many of the families in our shelters discover, the voucher amount is too low to offer any real help in leaving shelter. So on top of the difficulties of finding a landlord willing to accept a voucher, our families also have to try to find housing that rents for well below the market rate. That's why we urge the speaker to big, bring intro number 146 to a vote. This bill will increase the city FEPS voucher to better reflect the true cost of housing by tying it to HUD's fair market rent. This would significantly broaden access to many neighborhoods for voucher holders. Intro 146 is a key part of any response to the housing insecurity we're facing. Housing stability must be part of New York's blueprint for equity, and it must be a central part of an economic recovery plan. As New York City's largest provider of shelter and services for homeless families with children, we see firsthand how traumatic and damaging and disenfranchising homelessness is. And given the consequences for the financial and social emotional well being of families in the long term, the current crisis threatens to deepen and perpetuate existing inequities for decades by pushing thousands of New Yorkers more into homelessness. We have to take every step to prevent this tragedy. Thank you for your time and for your consideration today. Thank you for your testimony, Josefa. I'll now call on Eric Lee. Time starts now. Eric, I believe you are you are muted at this time. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eric Lee. I'm Dir director of policy and planning at Homeless Services United. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee for allowing me to testify today. Uh, for time considerations, I will summarize my written testimony. Um, in order to prevent record numbers of evictions and homelessness, the city and state must provide uh, arrears, payments, and ongoing rental assistance through current and new temporary programs by utilizing the infrastructure of existing city agencies like HRIG to quickly administer assistance. To be successful, we, we must deliver aid not just to those who qualify for existing eviction prevention services, but also to any household who cannot pay their rent due to the pandemic. Given the recent availability of additional federal assistance, we recommend the city and state utilize newly available funds to backfill the cost of, of new demand on existing aid programs in order to free up more flexible city and state funding to serve a wider array of populations and needs which are not covered by federal funding restrictions. HSU is a co-endorser of the recommendations of the New York City Eviction Prevention Roundtable with whom we are submitting joint testimony today. And in addition to, to these roundtable recommendations, we, we have additional recommendations to take in order to protect uh, unstably housed New Yorkers. The city must provide rental assistance arrears payments, either through one-shot deals or, or a new pandemic-specific one-time grant for any tenants unable to pay their rent due to the pandemic, regardless of future ability to pay or immigration status. HRA should waive repayment requirements for one-shot deals, and any federal rent relief allocated to one-shot deals or other one-time grants should not have a recoupment uh, requirement. To, to ensure households do not fall back into arrears, the, the city should expand eligibility of city FEPs in community to additional vulnerable populations, increase rent amount levels through the adoption of intro 146 and remove burdensome requirements like requiring a housing court stipulation. HRA should create a temporary rental assistance voucher which can pay up to one year's rent for any New Yorkers unable to pay rent due to the pandemic and are found ineligible for FEPs or city FEPs including immigrant families and individuals regardless of their status or lack future ability to pay rent. Used in combination with existing rental assistance programs, this would ensure that the majority of tenants remain stably housed. Um, efficient and timely administration of new and expanded eviction prevention resources must be a top priority. HRA can utilize its existing infrastructure to administer any new rental assistance and one-time grants 
processing requests on the back end while providing a no wrong door approach uh, for application process on the front end. Likewise, as demand increases, eviction prevention providers must also be adequately resourced to be able to provide assistance in a timely manner, including funding to hire additional home-based expired locations serving the highest eviction rates and more funding to expand access to rehousing services in the community. Um, we also uh, recommend the adoption of intro 1020 uh, to create a FEPS reporting uh, app, uh, and also to address the digi digital divide raised by Chair 11. Um, HRA staff should be located uh, in in-person locations like food banks and COVID testing and vaccination sites to assist people in person. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Eric. I'll now call on Gestana Simonovsky. The time will begin now. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in favor of the eviction moratorium. Much thanks to the committee chair, Steve Levin, for ha having this hearing on a very important issue. Thank you, Steve. My name is Gaetana Simonovsky, and I'm the director of the Income Support Services Unit at Community Service Society of New York. CSS is a nonprofit organization that addresses some of the most urgent problems facing low-income New Yorkers, including the city's housing crisis. New York City was already facing an affordable housing crisis when COVID-19 hit last March. Since then, the numbers of households seeking assistance with rental arrears from CSS, funded by the city council, more than doubled. There are many low-income New Yorkers who were barely making ends meet. When COVID-19 hit, many low-income households lost some or all their income due to businesses closing or when single parents had to quit their long-term jobs to care for their children. In addition, there are new requests coming from households that would under normal circumstances be considered middle income, but who fell into arrears when their incomes dwindled during the pandemic. As a case in point, Mr. M waited months to receive unemployment when the pandemic hit and he had lost his job at a luxury brand store in Manhattan. He turned 65 last August and did not want to start getting his retirement benefits early as it would not be enough for him to live on. He said that a year ago he was on the brink of suicide. He said, I was ready to jump. And now with COVID-19, he says, things are bad again. What else bad could happen? What's the next thing? So we're finding that a lot of people are contacting us for help with rent. Um, they're at their wits end. They're terrified as anyone would be of being evicted from their homes. We were able to help Mr. M with his arrears, bringing him to a zero balance. And he is now paying his rent moving forward with his unemployment while he's looking for work. As eviction cases begin to run their course within the court's chambers, New York does not have an adequate plan for addressing the long-term economic impact on tenants. Given the tremendous need for assistance with rental arrears, we are asking that the city council reinstate the 15% cuts to the Homelessness Prevention Fund initiative. With your generous help, CSS is working hard to ensure that individuals and families stay in their homes before the eviction moratorium ends. New York City must also take stronger action to, prevent, to protect extremely low-income New Yorkers from permanent homelessness and evictions, including strengthening housing voucher programs. For example, City FEPS is the best hope for many New Yorkers seeking to escape homelessness, but it often provides elusive hope because the voucher pays hundreds of dollars less than market rent. The City Council's pro proposal, Intro 146, would raise the maximum rent for the voucher to fair market rent, the same standard used for Section 8 and other housing subsidy programs. We urge the council to pass this legislation to unlock housing opportunity and choice for extremely low-income New Yorkers and to ensure that New York City's housing tools are working effectively for our residents as the city recovers from COVID-19. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify and offer our recommendations. Thank you so much. Thank you to this panel for your testimony. I am now gonna call up our next panel. In the following order, testifying will be George Sotiroff, Rosanna Cruz, and Jenny Laurie. Over to George Sotiroff. Your time will begin now. Uh, Chairman Levin and ladies and gentlemen, my name is George Sotiroff. I live at 901 Walton Avenue in the Bronx and I am a rent stabilized tenant. 
President Biden said in his inaugural address that sometimes we need a hand and sometimes we are called upon to lend a hand. President Biden has a vision for an interdependent America where people can rise up and succeed because of each other's help. Now we need to work together on the continuing problem of attacks on safe, affordable housing, attacks that have been both exposed and exacerbated by COVID-19. The success of Right to Counsel is unquestioned. Now it has to be expanded. Intro 2050 is important to me because I am a senior who no longer has the youthful strength to go out into the world to seek my fortune and fame. Mr. Dresler has reminded us that the legal landscape can turn on a dime. I don't know if and when circumstances will compel me to rely on RTC to save my abode. Unless I win the gazillion dollar lottery, the resources I have now are what I will have to sustain me until the time that the good Lord calls me home. The city can and should do more to stay evictions. This not only is a moral obligation, but is also wise fiscal policy. Evictions result in homelessness. Homelessness results in higher rates of exorbitant shelter costs for the city, as well as poorer health conditions for those victimized by homelessness. Degraded health conditions of the general populace eventually threaten even the well-to-do. Note, note bene, earlier this year, the coronavirus ran rampant in the White House, infecting the president himself to the point of hospitalization. Effects of this pandemic will have lifetime consequences. So to preempt as many threats as possible, I urge city council to pass intro 2050 right now so that more can avail themselves of an effective legal tool to protect their homes. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, George. Thank you for your testimony, George. I'll now call on Rosanna Cruz. Um, we'll begin now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levine and the council member of the Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to submit testimony on the oversight hearing on the DSS preparation for expiration of the eviction moratorium. My name is Rosanna Cruz and I'm the Senior Program Director of the Benefit Assistance Program at Good Shepherd Services, located in Park Slope in East New York, Brooklyn, where in 2019, we served over 6,000 clients and continue to support residents from across the city with a concentration in Brooklyn and Queens. I have been with the program since 2003, and prior to this work, I did community and tenant organizing. The Benefit Assistance Program provides individuals and family with hands-on assistance in applying for public benefits, and also offer legal counseling, help with financial planning, immigration services, and referral to other community-based agencies as needed. We also operate two DYCD contracts at the program, known as the Comprehensive Services for Immigrant Family and DYCD Neighborhood Development Area Healthy Family Program. Today, my testimony will emphasize on the challenges facing providers in supporting clients seeking rental assistance before the eviction moratorium ends. Good Shepherd is a member of the Eastern Brooklyn Emergency Response Collaborating. In August of 2020, we collaborated to help two housing town hall individuals meeting in English and Spanish. The sessions were attended by 80 people and impressions on Facebook reached over 100,000, uh, over 100 individuals. COVID-19 exacerbated the condition in the community we support. And as such, we experienced an increase in the number of clients requesting assistance with the One Shot Deal Emergency Assistance Program and the Rent Relief Program. One of our main concerns with this program is that we are not sure when the community will recover from the financial hardship they are currently experiencing and be able to cover monthly expenses and comply with the repayment options available through the One Shot Deal program. Even during the pandemic, the state is requiring clients to get a third party to prove their futurability to pay rent once a one shot deal is granted to help them in this case. 
the requirements was a challenge prior to COVID-19 and is resulting in as applicants declining this resource. Applicant has found it difficult to identify someone in their network to not only sign off, but take on the responsibility of a third party. Another issue we are experiencing is that for the clients collecting unemployment due to work and school closure and lack of childcare, the rent relief program is rejecting applicants because their income between April to July was higher than their income prior to March 2020. Client income was higher during the month as a result of the pandemic unemployment assistance program. An applicant are being denied from this program due to this reason. We kindly request that the council strongly support a waiver to the requirement to apply to rental programs due to the current public health and financial crisis. It would take our community residents months, if not years, to recover emotionally and financially from the current situation resulting from COVID. From COVID. The concert should expect residents from across the city to end up in housing court for non-payment cases, which may lead to eviction if the requirements for the existing program do not change. We cannot expect low-income families to recover without the financial support to pay rent to arrears. Landlords are also getting desperate and harassing tenants to pay their rent. In these cases, we are helping family connect to legal assistance to not only understand their rights as a tenant, but also support them if they have been served court documents by the landlords. The city and the state must look to support programs that allow providers to create more mediation with family and more accessibility. Some of these programs currently have many requirements. For the one shot deal emergency assistance program, HRA to waive the third party agreement requirement during the pandemic. As for the rent relief program, the state should only consider the income of the individual prior to the pandemic and not the pandemic unemployment assistance income. The pandemic unassistant income is affecting family ability to get public assistance and disqualifying them from critical programs like CDFED. We need to count for the income of residents prior to COVID-19. Thank you for the opportunity to submit our testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. I'll now call on Jenny Laurie for testimony. Time will begin now. Thanks very much. Thank you to Chair Levin and to the City Council for examining this really important issue. My name is Jenny Laurie and I'm the Executive Director of Housing Court Answers. We have been operating a hotline since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic sh shutdown, thanks in large part to city council funding. Um, we've been matching tenants facing eviction with attorneys in the right to counsel practice area, as well as assisting those with emergency housing conditions and illegal lockouts. Uh, since October 1st, we've been taking as many as 200 calls a day um, as more and more tenants learned that the, um, the blanket moratorium expired. Housing Court Answers supports the passage of intro 250, I'm sorry, 2050, which would allow for the immediate implementation of the right to counsel for tenants facing eviction. We urge the city to pressure the state and the court system to slow the pace of cases as housing court reopens so that legal service providers are able to provide robust representation in every case. We also urge the city to pressure the state and the court system to institute a meaningful moratorium that will carry folks into a time when the pandemic and the economic crisis are over and people can safely return to work, school, and normal lives. The success of Right to Counsel was clear prior to the COVID crisis. So intro 2050 is an obvious next step as we look to the end of the pandemic and to the possibility of a new administration coming in 2022 that might, 2022 that might not be as welcoming to write to council as the current administration. One landlord association estimated that there are 185,000 tenant households facing uh, at least two months of rent arrears. The court system had 200,000 cases already on the books when COVID started and a number of another 40,000 plus cases were filed during the fall. This means that there will be tens of thousands of, of eviction cases ready to start when court reopens fully. Housing Court Answers has been working with the great staff of the Office of Civil Justice to get tenants who call our hotline assigned counsel through the pandemic. 
tenants with lockouts, terrible housing conditions, and those whose pre-COVID eviction cases were revived. Council in these cases has been such a success that there have been almost zero evictions in the city during the COVID pandemic. We need to provide counsel to all tenants with new cases that come into the courts. If the city doesn't have the capacity, the flow of cases has to be restricted, not the obligation to provide counsel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thanks for the great work that you all do. Thank you. Very important. Thank you to this panel. I will now call on our next panel. The next panel will testify in the following order. Esteban Giron, Lauren Springer, and Malika Connor. I'll now call on Esteban Giron. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon. My name is Esteban Giron, and I'm a rent stabilized tenant and member of the Crown Heights Tenant Union. Um, tenants have spent the past year stepping up to fight for our neighbors because of the massive failure of the federal, state, and local government to do the bare minimum to protect us. Hundreds of us have gathered outside of our local housing courts for a series of direct actions, each time winning temporary reprieves and extensions, and finally winning a longer one in December. The passage of Right to Council in 2017 has been a game changer, yet only two out of the five zip codes in Crown Heights are currently covered, and a single person working full-time making minimum wage in New York City is also not covered. That means that as of right now, tenants in my building are eligible while those two blocks away are not. And of course, if someone in my building happens to work at McDonald's at minimum wage and their supervisor schedules them for 32 hours a week instead of 30 hours a week, they are no longer eligible. So while we appreciate the uh, host today's decision to extend the right to counsel to most tenants, regardless of zip code or income during this pandemic, administrative policy is no substitute for a law on the books. I've personally been denied an attorney in housing court in two separate cases for being slightly over the income threshold, despite there being a provision for a waiver that I was never informed of on either occasion. So I don't think tenants or this council can leave the lives of vulnerable tenants at the mercy of Mr. Dressler's intent. This pandemic brought our neighborhood to its knees. COVID came to collect on years of systemic inequalities like housing insecurity. Many of our neighbors struggled to make rent before the pandemic and were at risk of eviction. With higher than average unemployment rates due to COVID, once the moratorium is lifted, our vulnerable neighbors will be sitting ducks for landlords. Intro 2050 can be a shield between them and being thrown out in the streets. You've probably heard the statistic that by December of last year, evictions could be linked to over 400,000 excess cases of COVID and 10,700 COVID deaths. But we should call those what they are, 10,700 COVID murders because they were caused by the greed and inhumanity that results from commodifying housing because they were 100% avoidable. The new protections that we won on December 28th are the strongest in the country, but there are loopholes. Administrative judges are actively working to undermine the new law. In setting up the new HNP part that Mr. Dressler seems so proud of, the courts are sifting through current cases, regular cases, to determine if there are possible nuisance claims contained in those cases. What OCA and OCJ have done runs counter to the spirit and intent of the law that tenants worked so hard to win. These nuisance holdovers were supposed to be a rarity. Instead, these agencies have helped landlords provide, provide the landlords with a clear path around that law, and that does not inspire confidence. This crisis was not an accident, it was the result of decisions made by leaders who were supposed to protect the most vulnerable among us. And gentrification was not inevitable. No one forced my local council member to welcome Trump supporting luxury developers into our neighborhood to give away our public land for crumbs of un unaffordable housing. But here we are asking our government to do the bare minimum to protect our people by ensuring that we have a fighting chance with an attorney in house housing court. I urge you to pass intro 2050 without delay. Don't let your legacy depend on the promises of bureaucrats, no matter how convincing they sound. Time has expired. Thank you, Chair Levin, for giving tenants a chance to speak about this issue on the record, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you, Esteban, for your testimony. I'll now call on Laura's, Lauren Springer for her testimony. Your time will begin now. My name is Lauren Springer, and I'm a tenant leader with Catholic Migration Services, a nonprofit legal services provider and a community-based organization that does tenant organizing work. I'm also an active member of the New York City Right to Council Coalition. I strongly urge the City Council to pass Intro 2050 amending Local Law 136 to eliminate the five-year phase and period and immediately guarantee the right to counsel to all eligible tenants. The hardships of 2020 clearly showed us how important it is to have a universal right to counsel in place right now. The COVID-19 health crisis has exposed the depth of the city and state housing crisis, 
the importance of housing the homeless and the critical need to protect those currently housed. In the midst of this pandemic, there is an urgent need to prevent eviction as it places individuals, families, and communities at higher risk of illness, disability, and death. The current state and federal eviction protections are inadequate and because of loopholes and confusing and complex legal mandates, they have not prevented all tenants from being sued by landlords and, and put at risk of losing their homes. Once these protections expire, even more tenants will be facing the threat of eviction. No tenant should have to face the possibility of an eviction without a lawyer fighting on their behalf. Before the pandemic, housing court was already difficult to maneuver. Now it is even more complicated with all the new intricate rules, executive orders, and health guidelines that need to be followed. Pre-COVID, there was a veto-proof majority in favor of expand, expanding the RTC law. Prior to this pandemic, the City Council was on track to pass Intro 1104 and 1529, which would strengthen and expand the landmark RTC legislation. These bills garnered the support of more than two-thirds of the City Council membership. Moreover, the right to counsel law works. Three years worth of data indicated that 86% of tenants with a RTC lawyer were able to remain in their homes. Therefore, we should have everyone's support in passing Intro 20, 50 should be easy. OCJ testified that in practice during this pandemic, they have been assigning counsel without reference to zip codes. That change needs to be codified into law. By anchoring the phase in to lawyer capacity rather than by neighborhood, intro 2050 would require no additional city funding. In fact, the city now facing a massive economic public health and homelessness crisis would save and shelter healthcare and other costs accruing from evictions. In short, Passing intro 2050 would be a win-win situation for New York City and the tenants who make up the backbone of the city. The city council must do everything in its power to take the necessary steps to protect tenants and pass intro 2050. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Springer. Thanks again, Lauren, for your testimony. Thank you. I will now call on Malika Connor. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Levin, Council Members Levine and Gibson, and members of the Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Malika Connor, and I'm the Director of Organizing with the Right to Counsel Coalition. We are proud of New York City's groundbreaking Right to Counsel legislation and applaud the City Council, the Mayor, and the Office of Civil Justice for its dedication to making Right to Counsel available to more New Yorkers during the pandemic. The law has tremendously impact has tremendous impact in its first three years of implementation, with 86% of tenants who had the right to counsel winning the, the right to fight to remain in their homes. Community groups are actively using right to counsel as a powerful tool to protect and advance tenants' rights, and right to counsel has also helped develop a body of more just case law, lower tenants' rents, restabilize apartments, and has forced landlords to make repairs. Tenants across New York City need right to counsel now more than ever. The COVID-19 pandemic and ensuing economic downturn have only worsened the eviction crisis. Nearly 1.5 million New Yorkers are unable to pay rent due to the pandemic, and many of the more than 200,000 cases currently paused by New York State's Emergency Co Eviction and Foreclosure Protection Act will be allowed to move forward after February 26th. The current federal and state eviction protections also include a number of loopholes and confusing legal mandates that have and continue to allow landlords to take tenants to housing court and put tenants at risk of losing their homes. With the threat of eviction higher than ever before, tenants need right to counsel now. Intro 2050 would amend local law 136 and require immediate implementation of right to counsel, making it a right for all eligible tenants to have an attorney right now and would enable the city to phase in right to counsel by lawyer capacity instead of by zip code, thereby ensuring that no case moves forward without an attorney. Baseline in the mayor's budget, right to counsel will require no additional funds and will save the city millions of dollars in shelter, health care, and other costs that would otherwise be accrued when families are evicted. We applaud the city for modifying the implementation of right to counsel through the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that no case in any neighborhood moves forward without an attorney. This has proven to be a remarkably successful model that we need to continue. The crisis won't end when the city is vaccinated and will have long lasting effects on our economy, health and communities. We cannot allow any New Yorker who has survived COVID-19 to face eviction alone. The current model of assigning counsel to all cases in court needs to be permanent. 
We know this model is possible in part because there are few cases moving forward thanks to the tireless work of the tenant movement to halt cases and evictions. But if and when more cases move more quickly, the city and state can muster the political will to continue this model by monitoring legal capacity and adjusting cases once the legal services organizations reach their maximum capacity. Judges have the discretion to adjourn cases indefinitely, and there's no reason why they can't do this, especially right. during one of during one of the most defining moments of our time. The Office of Civil Justice has already proven able to negotiate with the courts to do this, but the city council must act to give them the authority to make this model law. We must make sure no case moves forward without an attorney, period. New York City can and should do more to stop evictions. Right to counsel has proven to be an immensely effective tool to stopping evictions, and now is the time to strengthen the law by passing intro 2050. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for your work on this important legislation. Thank you, Malika, and thank you to this entire panel for your testimony. I will now call on our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order, Laura Govan, Chaplain Sandra Mitchell, and Joanne Grell. I'll now call on Laura Govan. Your time will begin now. Hello, my name is Laura Govan. I'm here to testify in favor of the passing of Intro 250, which would require immediate implication of rights to counsel. As a rent stabilized tenant from the Bronx where I resided for 33 years and forcefully evicted. Right to counsel is important to me because of my experience in housing court with illegal eviction, thereafter legal lockouts while receiving temporary sheltering through the New York City government, landlord harassment and needed repairs. I endured sadly. Tenants face with forcibly being removed from their homes, having the right to a lawyer is key to being able to stay in their homes. Intro 250, 2050 would make it a right for eligible tenants across the city, New York City to have an attorney. The city can and should do more to stop forceful evictions. No one should be homeless fear of or fear of losing their homes, especially during a pandemic. I urge my city council to pass intro 2050 right now so more people have the right to counsel and use it to defend their homes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for your testimony. I will now call on Chaplain Sandra Mitchell. Good time. We'll be Good here. afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Grace and peace to all who are in my listening ear. Um, I'm testifying on behalf of uh, CASA Community New Settlement Apartments, CASA Community Action for Safe Apartments for the Northwest Bronx Community Clergy Coalition and also for as I am a tenant leader in my building at 253 West 181st Street and testifying on behalf of those who have disabilities, people who are living with disabilities, and I am in that group. I wanna thank you for the time to be able to uh, express to you the, it is so important, it is just so important for the lives of our city and for the, the, the world to be able to see New York City, the epicenter of the world, to come through this pandemic. We are setting a precedent. We have to pass the right to counsel intro 2015 when people are facing eviction. We have to show that we are humane and make sure that no one gets evicted, no one goes into court alone. If a person is suspected of committing a crime, they have a right to an attorney. But if a person during a pandemic loses their income, uh, I'm not understanding why is this the debate? Pass intro 2015 because we need it, because it's the right thing to do. It's a humane thing to do. It's going to cost the city so much money. I can't even count how much money it's going to cost the city to haul people into court, to throw people out into the street, 
and then there, then the health costs and whatever else happens, sometimes leading to death. Unfortunately, there was no right to counsel when I needed an attorney. I didn't have money for an attorney. I was hurt on the job. And with my workman's compensation case going on and on, there was no recourse for me. And that's why I joined with Community Action for Safe Apartments in the Northwest Bronx Community Clergy Coalition and also to, to create the right to counsel. I've gone into the courts and seen the despair and the mental anguish that is being forced on people when they are facing eviction. I, by trade, I'm a mental health counselor. I cried with them because it happened to me and I saw it happening to them. That's why we need to pass intro 2050, 2050, 2050, because we are destroying our city and we are destroying our economy. We need to pass intro 2015, especially because we, have, we are in a pandemic. So if the pandemic doesn't knock you out, wipe you out, then the threat of eviction will mentally, physically, and financially. I wanna thank the city council members who are strongly advocating and pushing for intro 2015 to be passed. And I wanna thank the distinguished New York City wow. Council Committee on General Welfare to hear my cry, to really hear my cry. Please, we need this to save lives, to save our city and to do the right thing and be humane. Thank you so very much and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much, Chaplain. I really appreciate your, your input. Thank you. Thanks again, Chaplain Mitchell, for your testimony. I'll now call on Joanne Grell. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Levin, Chair Levin's adorable son, and to the many agencies and organizations represented here today for your time this afternoon. My name is Joanne Grell and I'm a member of CASA and I'm also the president of My Buildings Tenant Association. And I'm here on behalf of all of my neighbors to ask for your support in passing intro 2050. Due to this global pandemic, job loss and economic hardship have greatly affected a family's ability to pay rent with communities of color disproportionately at risk of eviction. In my relatively small building of 32 units, eight families are facing eviction come May 1st. Many of them were full-time employees in industries that were hardest hit by the COVID-19 job loss. And several of my neighbors have talked to me about having to apply for food stamps and stand on pantry lines for the first time in their lives. Others have had to choose between buying Pampers for their children or paying their rent. And sometimes they've chosen to pay their rent. With over 46% of New Yorkers facing eviction come May 1st, we're facing an urgent and unprecedented housing crisis and tenants facing eviction must have legal counsel in housing court if they're to succeed in staying in their homes, regardless of their zip code. As Council Member Levine and others have already stated, passing intro 2050 will not require any additional funding from the city. It will actually save the city millions of dollars in costs associated with providing temporary housing and other resources to families who are evicted. The limited protections currently in place are insufficient and passing intro 2050 is critical in preventing adults and children in our hardest hit communities from being evicted. My neighbors experiencing financial hardship due to COVID have exhausted their limited funds and cannot afford an attorney to represent them in housing court. And our zip code is not eligible for RTC right to counsel. And while city agencies and offices work through the logistics and red tape of how to handle the impending influx of evictions and with eviction moratoriums and other relief set to expire, Without intro 2050, we will see a significant number of evictions granted, and this will cause irreparable and long-term harm to our communities. Despite Mr. Dressler's statement that it's always the intention to do away with zip codes, he also stated that things can change at the drop of a dime. And that is why it is imperative that intro 2050 be secured into law. As we've seen with the incredible success of Right to Counsel Local Law 30, 136, Intro will help keep families in their homes. And this is something that the housing court was originally designed to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Grell. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment, <laughs> to my son. Thank you. Of course. Thank you to this entire panel for your testimony. 
I will now call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order, Gabriella Mailspin, Kathleen Brennan, and Amanda Lipari. We will begin with Gabriella Mailspin. Time starts now. Oh. Hello? Um, sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you, sorry. Um, hi, my name, um, sorry. Uh, can you give me one second? Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Gabriella Malisman. I'm a paralegal, I'm a housing paralegal with New York Legal Assistance Group. And I, along with my supervisor, Kathleen Brennan, will be, testi will be testifying today. Um, NILAG uses the power of the law to help New Yorkers in need combat social and economic injustice. We address emerging and urgent legal needs with comprehensive free legal services, impact litigation, policy advocacy, and community education. Um, today, we'll be speaking about how essential it is that DSS respond to the needs of the eviction moratorium of the impending eviction, the end of the eviction moratorium, by expanding access to critical Hello. vouchers. Such Hi, Hi. Hello. would you try to reach me? Okay. Well, by expanding access to city FEPS, allowing eligible households to apply for FEPS the moment they have rent arrears and, in, and passing intro 2050. DSS should expand access to city FEPS by making long-term tenancy an eligibility criterion for this critical rent subsidy. The city's family homelessness and eviction prevention supplement, also known as city FEPS, is a critical subsidy for many low-income renters in New York City. Administered by the Department of Social Services, this rental subsidy allows families both with and without minor children to remain in their apartments by ensuring that recipients do not pay more than 30% of their income towards their rent. Um, currently, NYC tenants must meet the following criteria to be eligible for city FEPS. Make less than 200% of the federal poverty guidelines, have a rent that falls under the city FEPS rental guidelines, and meet one of the following criteria. Have veteran status, have prior shelter history, receive adult protective services or live in a rent controlled apartment. In addition, city FEPS vouchers are also provided to shelter residents to ensure that they can exit shelter and access permanent housing. This voucher is subject to renewal every year for up to five years. This voucher is important for adult only families and elderly tenants because the state funded FEPS program focuses almost exclusively on assisting families with minors in the household. Since the inception of the city FEPS program in 2018, this voucher has helped thousands of families both remain in their apartments and exit the city's crowded shelter system. However, DSS has the opportunity to expand eligibility criteria to ensure that more families can access this aid and reduce shelter costs. The current eligibility criteria are unnecessarily restrictive. City FEPS eligibility criteria should be expanded to include long-term tenancies of at least 10 years and tenants receiving SSI and SSD. Prior to its supersession by City FEPS, the City's Special Exit and Prevention Supplement, formerly known as SEPS, allowed program administrators to grant the supplement to long-term Time tenants. expired. Oh. At NILAG, we have noticed that only a small fraction of our clients meet the current City FEPS criteria, but many meet the prior long-term tenancy criteria. Additionally, city FEPS rent levels must be increased to keep fit pace with fair market rents. Um, sorry, um, do I have a minute to finish yes. my thing? Go you ahead, so yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, current city FEPS rent limits are much lower than fair market value. For example, in order for a family of one to qualify for a city FEPS voucher, their rent must not be greater than 1,265 per month. However, the average rent for tenants in NYC is often upwards of 2,000. There is currently city council legislation that aims to address this issue. Um, and we, we sincerely recommend that we, um, council member Stephen T. Levine introduce intro 146, which was last discussed by this committee in September, 2020. Therefore, we urge the committee to, we urge the committee to pass this legislation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriella. And I, I assure you that passing intro 146 is actually at the top of my legislative agenda. This year, we have around 38, 40 sponsors. It's a veto proof majority for anybody that's counting. So, you know, we hope that that will get passed soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Gabriella. And I apologize for mis mispronouncing your last name. I'll now call on Kathleen Brennan. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman Levin and members of the council staff. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm testifying in conjunction with Ms. Malispin. Um, in addition to expanding the city FEPS criterion, um, another way DSS can prepare for the end of the eviction moratorium is by making the process of applying for rental arrears, grants, and FEPS as simple as possible for tenants. Due to COVID-19 restrictions that severely limit in-person visits to job centers, DSS stressed online applications through the Access HRA portal. However, many of our clients and tenants with similar backgrounds to our clients simply lack the technology to apply for grants online. Many of NILAC's clients experience difficulties applying for rental arrears grants over the telephone or obtaining and submitting a paper rental arrears grant application. DSS to continue to explore ways to make the process for applying for rental arrears grants easier for, for those clients who do not have ready access technology. And DSS should expand its ability to accept and process applications over the phone, add staff to the job centers who can expedite the processing of rental arrears grants and enhance language access by, by hiring multilingual staff. While access HRA can be useful, it can be difficult to navigate and tenants frequently experience technological glitches when trying to submit rental arrears grants. Many tenants who do manage to submit applications online via the HRA access portal do not receive timely response and are frequently not informed of the documents they have, they have uploaded have been received or the status of their application. It, we ask that we urge that DSS contact tenants by phone to verify the application has been submitted and to follow up with any issues. As NILAC, NILAC tenants are doing it, we've seen the positive impact of the city's right to council program and we urge its continued expansion. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. I'll now call on Amanda Lipari. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Lipari and I'm a tenants rights attorney in the Staten Island neighborhood office of the Legal Aid Society. I'm also a member of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, Local 2325 of the United Auto Workers, and a member of the Right to Counsel Working Group within the union. I testify today on behalf of ALAA to urge the City Council to pass Intro 2050, which would expedite the Right to Counsel rollout by mandating that all eligible tenants sued in housing court receive legal representation. The Right to Counsel program is an unequivocal success. Since its implementation, 86% of tenants who receive representation remain in their homes. Tenant representation is essential to combat the state-sanctioned violence of evictions. Evictions are devastating at all times, but the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded their effects. Evictions are now a death sentence that more than 1.5 million New Yorkers face. Failure to fully implement right to counsel will lead to increased evictions, which result in displacement, educational disruption for children, and increased risk of contracting coronavirus, either by doubling up with friends or family or entering city shelter, city shelter system. Full implementation of right to counsel cannot wait another year. Now is the time to guarantee all tenants who are eligible can receive representation and remain housed. COVID-19 has exacerbated the material conditions that cause evictions. There are still no adequate solutions to our housing crisis. While the state established a somewhat robust statute intended to protect tenants and the federal government established limited protections for tenants through the CDC, these piecemeal laws are complicated. They do not provide blanket protection from eviction and contain many loopholes that are easily exploited by landlords. It is imperative that tenants have access to counsel who can both explain the current protections and litigate on their behalf to ensure these laws are fully and fairly implemented. Our city government must step up where it can and work to ensure the tools provided by the state and federal government do not languish. The city also has an independent responsibility. The city must increase its flexibility in awarding rental arrears grants. Tenants are coming to our office with over $20,000 in arrears. While this was previously the exception, it is now the norm. HRA's response must meet this moment. Pre-pandemic criteria will not suffice. Arrears grants must be quickly processed and liberally granted to ensure tenants remain supported in their homes. Ed eviction defense is a crucial part of a holistic, competent pandemic response. Legal service providers are ready and able to assist in recovery. The city must ensure that the right to counsel program is fully funded at the cost of service so that legal service providers can continue this work. I urge the city council to pass intro 2050 and any further legislation needed to support tenants. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. 
Thank you to this panel for your testimony. I will now call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order. Jessica Penkoff, Alexandra Doherty, and Amy Kwok. And we'll begin with Jessica Penkoff. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Jess Penkoff, and I'm a staff attorney for, the, for Housing Rights and Special Populations at Volunteers of Legal Service, also known as VALS. VALS was established in 1984 by law firms and by the New York City Bar Association in response to federal budget cuts in legal services funding. And over 35 years later, we run nine projects that serve low-income New Yorkers, made possible in large part by the assistance of the pro bono capacity of our law firm and corporate sponsors. Across all of our projects at VALS, we encounter New Yorkers from various subpopulations, senior veterans, formerly homeless young adults, recently unemployed workers, all who have limited income and limited resources who are facing housing insecurity. Many have fallen behind on their rent because they had to stop working to care for a sick loved one, or because they lost their job due to the pandemic, or because they contracted COVID themselves. And even New Yorkers who are not behind on the rent are facing housing insecurity. I recently advised a senior whose landlord has been harassing her to move because he has pandemic related losses and wants to sell the building. And our conversation was the first time that she learned that self-help eviction is illegal. Had we not spoken, she likely would have moved out of her home in the dead of a pandemic winter with nowhere else to go for fear of being illegally and forcibly removed by her landlord. She was fortunate to have been referred to our office, but there are many other at-risk New Yorkers that are not able to access free civil legal services from our organization or from one of our many legal service partners testifying today. And we will really never know how many New Yorkers have been displaced simply because they were unaware of their legal rights or options. Under the current universal access law, only New Yorkers in pre-designated zip codes are guaranteed an attorney to defend them in housing court. We frequently give advice and counsel to New Yorkers who are not covered by right to counsel because they don't live in the correct zip code, like the senior that I spoke to whose landlord was harassing her. And most of the or older New Yorkers that we've counseled at our legal clinics at senior centers that we hosted prior to the shutdown do not live in those zip codes either. Aside from end of life planning, housing issues are the most common that we see, especially among older New Yorkers. Um, and we hosted clinics in Council Member Ayala's district and Council Member Callos's district where many New Yorkers are not covered. We also hosted clinics in Council Member Chin's district where currently no one is covered by the zip code scheme. Intro 2050 would ensure that no low income tenant facing eviction is denied counsel. Uh, and in light of the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic crisis, um, communities that are low income and especially communities of color cannot afford to wait another year and a half for this program to roll out. Paychecks and stimulus checks have stopped arriving, but rent bills have not. And current moratoria Time do not expired. provide rent relief. They do not provide rent relief. And one day those bills will have to be paid or tenants will face homelessness. Uh, we're mindful of capacity concerns. We encourage folks, we encourage the city to provide attorneys in line with the capacity of legal service providers and low income tenants deserve to have four walls around them and a roof over their heads while they face this pandemic. Thank you for allowing us to testify. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. I'll now call on Alexandra Doherty. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Alexandra Doherty. I'm a senior staff attorney and policy counsel of the civil justice practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. I'd like to thank the committee general welfare and chair Levin for inviting us to testify today. And I'm here to express our support for the expansion of right to counsel for New York City tenants, as well as the immediate expansion of the city's existing voucher and rental assistance programs. Uh, BDS provides client-centered legal services, social work support, and advocacy for almost 30,000 clients every year, and our civil justice practice aims to reduce the civil collateral consequences of criminal and family and immigration court involvement. Uh, we applaud the city for expanding eligibility for right to counsel and urge city council to make the program available immediately, given that tens of thousands, if not more, of New York City tenants have been unable to pay rent 
due to the COVID crisis. Uh, but in addition, the city can do more now to help tenants maintain stable housing. About a quarter of New York City renters are behind in rent payments and owe as much as a billion dollars in arrears from the past year. Uh, those arrears are going to be due immediately when the eviction moratoria expire. Rather than waiting until families are on the brink of eviction, the city should immediately remove barriers to rental assistance and vouchers. Uh, first, DSS, DSS should prioritize vouchers because they ensure ongoing affordability and housing stability. Uh, the city should remove the onerous eligibility criteria and application procedures that prevent many tenants from accessing vouchers. Eligibility should not require a current housing court case or imminent eviction. DSS should also expand the number of providers authorized to screen tenants uh, and complete applications so that more tenants can access vouchers and pay their arrears prior to the moratoria expiring. Um, and we also urge city council to pass intro 146. And I'm glad to hear that there is a veto proof majority um, that bill would raise voucher rent limits and expand the stock of affordable housing uh, available to voucher holders. Second, while we applaud HRA's efforts to facilitate applications during the pandemic, there are still serious barriers that are preventing our clients from accessing um, benefits and public assistance. HRA's remote application process is made insurmountable by changing deadlines and confusing rules. Applications are routinely denied because many of our clients, like other homeless and low-income applicants, lack consistent internet access or uh, they miss the single interview call that comes from a blocked number. Uh, these applications should be made fully available by phone and the whole process should be more flexible to ensure that all New Yorkers in need can get assistance. HRA should not require that tenants prove future ability to pay rent to get approved for a one-shot deal, especially now during, um, during the ongoing pandemic. Time expired. Can't, can't meet that burden while facing illness, unemployment, and other uncertainty. Um, so again, I thank the chair and the committee, and I'll direct you to my written testimony for more detailed comments. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I'll now call on our next witness, Amy Kwok. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Amy Kwok, staff attorney in the civil defense practice at Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. NDS is a community-based holistic public defender office that provides high quality legal services to residents of Northern Manhattan. NDS is a member of the Right to Counsel Coalition and serves the community through the Right to Counsel program. Thanks to the efforts of tenants, organizers, and community leaders, New York City has been at the forefront of guaranteeing tenants legal representation in housing court, and the Right to Counsel law has been an undeniable success. The empirical evidence is clear. Tenants represented by an attorney are significantly more likely to remain in their homes. This protects families, preserves communities, and prevents the destabilization that too often precipitates criminal legal involvement. Put plainly, it's good for the entire city. As a holistic public defender, NDS knows that an eviction is often the first domino to fall with cascading impacts ranging from prosecution and incarceration to deportation to having a family torn apart by ACS. The stakes are even higher in the midst of a once in a lifetime global pandemic that has disproportionately ravaged black and brown communities. A family's right to remain safely housed and out of crowded shelters is literally a matter of life or death. Yet under the current phase in plan by zip code, too often by the time we have taken a case, the tenant has unknowingly signed a settlement agreement an attorney would never have advised them to or waived important rights and defenses in court. The unreasonable expectation placed on tenants to properly navigate the opaque rituals of housing court, craft a defense and conduct a trial has never been more apparent than it is now when they face the labyrinth of state and federal COVID-19 eviction protections. Since last March, there has been a whirlwind of successive state and federal laws and orders, each with their own protections, caveats, loopholes, and requirements of tenants, further obfuscated by competing messaging from the governor's office. For example, last month, NDS was retained by a client who had two roommates and whose landlord sought to execute a warrant of eviction. One of the roommates was able to access another right to counsel attorney, but the other was left to fend for himself. And when asked by the judge, what do you have to say as to why you should not be evicted? 
He could only respond, I don't know what to say. What could he be expected to say? What would you say if you were asked the same question? For the COVID-19 related state and federal protections to be effective, right to counsel must be immediately expanded to include all income eligible New Yorkers. And to be meaningful, it must be implemented so as to allow the full representation of tenants' interests, not just the rubber stamping of settlements for the sake of processing cases and lining landlords' coffers. Evictions are always an act of violence. During the Time pandemic, expired. they can be deadly. The wave of evictions is coming and New York must step up to meet this historic moment by expanding the right to counsel with the passage of intro 2050. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. Thank you to this entire panel for your testimony. I will now call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order, Tawaki Komatsu and Spencer Hanvik. Over to Tawaki. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, so earlier today, you had people from HRA testifying. You had Jordan Dressler. You had, um, I think, Aaron Drinkwater. There was a mention of OTDA, the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance. Um, for roughly, uh, what, like three years, I've been in litigation against HRA. I've talked to Stephen Banks, um, Stephen Banks face-to-face -face repeatedly, recorded him on audio repeatedly. I've talked to Stephen Levin about that repeatedly. I recorded a conversation I had with Mr. Levin in the committee room in City Hall on, I think, August 13th of 2019 in regards to FOIL information, the fact that HRA has not been providing me um, documents that I need in relation to housing litigation that this hearing today is about. So essentially, um, on or about February 18th of 2016, um, HRA actually subjected me to an, an illegal bait and switch fraud and forgery in regards to an apartment lease agreement that I talked to Mr. Levin repeatedly about, testified truthfully repeatedly about to no avail. I have federal court litigation against the city of New York currently. So bottom line is um, I got a voicemail message from OTDA earlier today letting me know that it's going to have a fair hearing with me on February 9th, only because of the fact that HRA refused to comply with its legal duty to provide me documents for a fair hearing that was on, what, December 23rd of last year in regards to housing litigation. So the point is, um, why are we having this fair hearing, why are we having this public hearing today um, for which Mr. Levin is the chairman when people have a face-to-face -face conversation with him repeatedly where he makes commitments saying, you know what, I'll try to help you. But in the end, he lies straight to your face. So I had a witness um, who lived in the building in which I reside, a disabled military veteran. He passed away on August 10th of last year, only because of the fact that HRA refused to provide him with a reasonable accommodation. I testified on his behalf to Mr. Levin on February, uh, I think, 4th of 2019. So again, the question is this, how many more people have to pass away before Mr. Levin will be fired from the city council and Mr. Banks will be prosecuted for criminal negligence? Thank you. Thanks for your testimony, Tawaki. I'll now move on to Spencer Hanvik for testimony. Time starts now. Hi there, my name is Spencer Handvik. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a member of Met Council on Housing. And during the pandemic, I've been working and learning with members of the RTC coalition. Um, I'm here to testify strongly in favor of passing Info 2050, which would make full implementation of right to counsel a matter of law rather than simply policy. Thank you for hearing my testimony. I'm a market rate tenant. I live in Brooklyn, been in my current apartment for six years. Um, note earlier uh, in this hearing, there was sort of a minimizing reference made to an imagined anticipated cliff uh, of a deluge of evictions, uh, of, of evictions. Um, and this is, I mean, clear, clearly not an imaginary thing. It's real. Real people are afraid of it. They're afraid for themselves. They're afraid for their loved ones. I'm afraid of it for myself. As we've been saying, housing is healthcare, and this is not healthy. Currently, I live with two other people. Uh, their stories aren't mine to tell, but their situations are even a bit more precarious than mine for reasons of benefits eligibility and for health reasons. Uh, since March, we've been unable to pay rent. 
like over one and a half million other New York residents. And the fact is as true for us as for everybody that housing is healthcare. In November, we received court papers for an eviction case before the current temporary and partial protections were put in place. And it's just like a staggeringly high number of other tenants, we were sent into an innavigable runaround trying to make contact with a dysfunctional court system and low access uh, or hope of access to legal service providers. This isn't healthy. This is dangerous. This contributes to the ongoing and intensifying public health crisis. Full right to counsel and the passage of intro 2050 is necessary for our health and safety. In my home, we're going through this. I see friends and neighbors who are already struggling, already pushed beyond any reasonable basic capacity for stress by this looming reality of this eviction cliff of housing court and possible evictions with no guarantee of support. Housing court has always been a challenge to navigate. And with the pandemic, as so many have already said, it's only gotten worse. I know that it's always been, and even more so, is well beyond my abilities and well beyond anybody's abilities to manage this on their own. Tenants need support. And Intro 2050 is a necessary part of that support. If housing is healthcare, which it is, the right to counsel in housing court is part of any serious healthcare oriented plan. Intro 2050 must be part of any serious housing effort, any serious public health effort. I appreciate, as we heard so much earlier, the, the court administrator's efforts to connect tenants with housing lawyers. And nonetheless, in spite of those efforts, speaking for myself and along with many others, I would feel more secure in my protections and in everyone's protections with the passage of Intro 2050 requiring in law immediate and full implementation of right to counsel. Evictions are deadly. The city can do more to stop evictions and the city must do more to stop evictions. And Intro 2050 is a crucial minimum piece of this. I urge the city council, please, Pass intro 2050. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. At this point, we've now heard from everyone who has signed up to testify. And we appreciate your time and your presence at our hearing today. If we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, at this time, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you in the order of hand raised. Seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing. And you can submit that testimony by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Levin, at this time, we've concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kilowan, and I wanna thank uh, all the members of the public for testifying today, as well as uh, members of the administration for testifying. I appreciate you all taking the time um, and your patience and your commitment to making sure that this city um, is and its residents are protected um, from um, the dangers of, of eviction um, and um, these terrible impacts of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, uh, we all have a tremendous amount of work to do going forward to make sure that um, uh, any any program um, or process moving forward is done equitably around the city um, and is is uh, meeting the needs of New Yorkers that are, are in need. And um, and with that, at three thirty four p.m., this hearing is.